one minute. I'll do it for him. All right, we're going to start in about 30 seconds. Be taking your last place. Get comfortable. <laughs> Welcome everyone. My name is Amy Gourlay and I am your moderator for the evening. I'm a mediator from Mediation Center and I brought with me uh, volunteers from community mediation centers throughout Minnesota. Uh, and before we start and tell you about the process uh, and start commenting, uh, the commissioners and leadership who are here would like to give you a welcome. I'll turn it over to Commissioner Landwehr from the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, who is standing, by the way, I'll be talking about the pink and the yellow mic, so you can see where it is. He is at the pink mic. Uh, and then um, we'll get a brief welcome also for, from Commissioner Stein from the PCA, and he is standing at the yellow mic. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you. Good evening, everybody. And I want to I ask if people could um, uh, please be quiet while we're, uh, while we're starting this out. And I also want to... Uh, advise people who are in the back that there are still a lot of seats up in the front. If you need a seat, come on up. There's seats on both sides as well. So please feel free to sit. This is going to be a long evening, so uh, don't, uh, don't try to stand up. So my name is Tom Lander, and I'm the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Thank you for coming here tonight. We very much appreciate everybody's being here. Uh, as you know, tonight we are hosting this public comment session for the, uh, uh, for the permits for the uh, PolyMet project, the draft permits for the PolyMet project hosted tonight by the Department of Natural Resources and by the Pollution Control Agency. With me tonight is John Langstein, the Commissioner of the Pollution Control Agency. At the table in the front here, Rebecca Flood, Assistant Commissioner of the Pollution Control Agency, and Barb Miramore, Assistant Commissioner with the Department of Natural Resources. We will be here to listen to you tonight. Um, as you know, we are taking comments. The DNR is taking comments on the draft permit to mine. Uh, that, uh, that information is available on our website, MNR, uh, uh, mndnr.gov. You can go on there. You can find all kinds of information. There's also an opportunity to comment on there. We encourage you to uh, take a look at that. Um, and I know that some of you were here earlier. We had the open house. We had an opportunity for you to ask questions of our staff. Well, now is our time to hear directly from you. So we're going to be uh, working through the moderator here to take your questions. And uh, I know that uh, this, is, this is one of those issues that people have a lot of different perspectives on, and we are, uh, we are respectful of all the perspectives. We want everybody to have a chance to uh, make their voice heard. We ask you to be respectful as well and uh, help us get through tonight, uh, allowing people to get their uh, diverse uh, comments heard. So I want to thank you again for being here tonight, and I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Stein for a few more words as well. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. And Commissioner Landwehr and I are glad to be here tonight with many of our staff from our agencies. Uh, we wanted to let you know that our staff are still going to be available to answer questions on specific details in the um, area where the open house was. If you hear about things or you think about something, you want to get a more detailed, in, informed uh, view of how our permits are written or specific details like that, you can go back to the open house area and speak with our staff tonight. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has three uh, draft documents out for review right now, and those are the subject of our meeting tonight that we'll be taking your comments on for the PCA's perspective. The first is the draft water quality permit uh, that has to do with the discharge to waters of the state and waters of the U.S. Uh, from the proposed mining project. The second is our draft air quality permit that has to do with uh, how air emissions would be handled from from this facility. And the third document that we're uh, receiving your comments on tonight is our water quality certification to the uh, Section 401 of the Clean Water Act, which has to do with impacts resulting from stream and wetland alterations associated with mining projects. Um, those are the things that we're interested in hearing your comments on. And as I mentioned, you can always submit your comments in various ways. If you're not able to speak uh, tonight before us, we have multiple other pathways that you'll be uh, informed about how to submit your comments. The Pollution Control Agency's comment period on those three documents is open until March 16th. March 16th, our comment period will close. I want to thank everyone for attending tonight as we're just uh, Join Commissioner Landwehr in, in asking for uh, 
respectful uh, conduct of the meeting so we can hear from as many people as possible tonight. Uh, we want to focus, I, in particular, those comments that would be most useful to our agency are the ones that are directly aimed at provisions of our permit or our, our action on the uh, water quality certification. And with that, uh, we know that this is an important uh, night for everyone to be together, to hear each other clearly. We ask for your uh, uh, listening ears to be uh, attentive on the speakers. I want to thank you, and I'll turn it back to our facilitator, Amy Gurley, who will help us get the details about how we'll take your comments tonight. Thanks. Flip slide. There are volunteers uh, wearing uh, bright yellow lanyards uh, with orange name tags. Uh, and I'll introduce them in just a minute and tell you what they're doing. Uh, if you see them, though, and you want to get a comment card or give us a comment card to put in the barrel where we're drawing them out, we will take uh, the cards the, for speakers, they're the orange ones, um, at any time during the evening. There's Jacqueline right there showing them off. Okay. Uh, and I want to thank them for uh, being here to help with the process. Right. So our job tonight, uh, myself and the volunteers, are to provide a transparent, impartial opportunity to speak to as many people as possible. Uh, none of us have ever worked for any of the agencies involved or PolyMet, uh, and our job is to support as many people who want to speak, uh, regardless of viewpoint, and to honor you in that way. Uh, we want to, um, uh, so if you want to speak, uh, let's see, it's Heron and Jacqueline have the cards uh, and it's randomly selected. So you can get a card from them, uh, put it in the box, uh, bring it up here. Ted and Joanna are helping to draw names. We'll draw names. We're going to write them down to uh, make sure that we don't have duplicates. Uh, and then hand them to Drew, who has the unenviable task of typing in front of all of you. So please, as you fill out your common cards, be as legible as possible. We apologize if we don't spell a name correctly. Um, we will actually type them into a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet we pre-populated. Some of you got to observe that process right before we started. Um, and so uh, we already have the first 10 speaker names, and we'll continue to draw names throughout the evening, slowing down around 8.30 to make sure that we can end at 9. Okay. Um, when you do see your name, feel free to make your way up. Uh, we have two mics going. I mentioned the yellow and the pink mic. Uh, Larry and Anne are the volunteers up here that will help you get ready to speak. Uh, we'll actually have you get ready so when per one person ends, the next person can start, and we're going to jump backwards and forwards between both mics uh, to be as efficient as possible. So make sure when you see your name, there'll be a color block by it. If you're chosen to speak, and go to the correct microphone and check in with uh, Anne or Larry who can help you get ready to go. Uh, please also state your name and spell it. Uh, the stenographers are here uh, and would appreciate being able to hear the spelling of your name and also the city you live in. Um, also, you can state any organization that you represent and if you have a specific permit you're commenting on, um, you can state it at that time. Uh, we will start the time after uh, the person whose name was chosen uh, states and spells their name and says the city. So that's when we'll start the time and you will have three minutes, up to three minutes to speak. I will give you a warning if you're speaking at 10 seconds. You'll just hear your voice kind of over the microphone say 10 and then at time I will say time so that you're aware that your time is up. Okay? Next slide, please. Um, Oh, he already went, to, he was ahead of me. Okay, let me just make sure that we got everything then. Thanks, Drew. <laughs> um, we didn't talk about uh, if your name comes up and you wish to pass your time to someone else, you can do that. However, you must be present in order to do that. So you would come and say, I am Amy Gourlay, and I'm passing my time to um, whoever you'd like to give it to. Uh, note that uh, if that person's name is drawn again, what we'll do is they'll let me know and I'll read it off just in case two names are very similar uh, so that you know why we've passed up a card. So if you see us pull a card and hand it over to me, I'll check with you to make sure that it's actually a duplicate. If you think it's not, just find one of the volunteers. Um, we don't plan to take any long breaks. We may need to take a brief break for if the stenographer, um, there's a stenographer switch or if they have a downtime or uh, we need just a brief breather. Also, if the room should get too noisy so that the speakers can't be heard, we will wait um, until it's quiet enough to proceed. Okay? Um, and with that, we've pre-populated the names. 
And I think Tom, is Tom Thompson was the first name? And are you ready to go? So Tom Thompson from Duluth. Also, if you're in the first five or six, you want to be making yourself up. If you're Tom, you want to be there by Larry at the yellow highlighter, yellow mic. And Brad, we'll be getting you ready over at the pink mic. All right. Good. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Tom Thompson, and I am on the executive board for the North Star chapter of the Sierra Club. I live halfway between where we are today and where PolyMed is proposed to be built. Some argue that we need more copper for our gizmos, our cell phones, our wind generators, our electric lines, our TVs, our Game Boys, our hybrid cars that need copper. So is there a shortage of copper? I looked at the copper markets yesterday and they didn't look like there was a shortage. If anything, the copper market was down, not up. Furthermore, copper disperse, is dis, uh, production is dispersed throughout the world, not just here. I don't think there is a need to fear that there won't be enough copper for our gizmos. Why not increase recycling efforts? And it should be noted that there is progress towards wireless electric transmission. Apple has pledged not to use mined materials in their products. And Subaru brags about all their parts being recycled. Another argument says that this country has more strict protections than most other countries, so do it here. To me, this is a, a comment on a sad state of affairs for the world, since I believe ours are, ours are far from what they should be. However, if this is true, I would like to see the list of foreign mines operating with inferior protections that will be closed should PolyMet be built. What? There isn't one? No other mines will close? That means that however good PolyMet might be or not be, it will add to the total amount of pollution from copper nickel mining in the world, not lower it. Regardless, PolyMet will add to the pollution going into the waters of northeast Minnesota, Lake Superior and the Boundary Waters. In the scheme of things, PolyMet is not needed. There is no apparent shortage of copper in the world. So if copper nickel mine really isn't needed that much, what do Minnesotans and Mer Americans get out of it? A permission slip will be given to a foreign corporation to dig gigantic holes, pile rocks into huge mountains, destroy thousands of acres of habitat, forests, wetlands, and recreational areas, create giant lakes full of toxins and heavy metals, and to allow sulfides into our rivers and streams, threatening wild rice and increasing the methylation of mercury infecting fish eaten by many, including children. Thus, much of the water we consider the bad, much of the area we consider Ten. the bad wor work of Minnesota, where people live and thrive, will in effect become a mining, a sulfide mining industrial zone. Ten. Don't permit. Thank you. Brad? Brad Boos, ready to go? And Mike Casey, make your way up front, be ready to go? My name is Brad Boos from uh, Moose Lake, Minnesota, and uh, I support PolyMet, and I want to defer my time to uh, Commissioner Keith Nelson. Good evening. I am Commissioner Keith Nelson, currently serve as the chair of the St. Louis County Board. Commissioner Landwehr, imagine the day that I would come in front of you and thank you. Um, I don't think you imagined that some years back. With that said, um, I, I truly do want to thank you for the science, for the work that you've done on this project. It is the people of St. Louis County that I have been so proud to serve for these last 14 years, truly appreciate the efforts that have been made. For my friends out there in labor, for my friends out there with the blue hats on, 
I cannot thank you enough for the patience that you have had. I hope that this is the last time we have to meet on a project which has significant merit and which has proven itself both in science and in process. To my dear friends out there with the orange bandanas, I have to tell you, um, I like a good cowboy. I like a good cowgirl. Um, and, and you are my friends. I hope that as this process moves forward and this project moves forward, you will join me in, in the prosperity that this county is certainly going to see as a result. With that, and since this or this, uh, the rules of this uh, event are that we can't uh, clap after people are done, I'm gonna cede the last minute of my time to, to my friends out there in labor who wanna use their two hands to clap now and work later at PolyMet. Mike Casey, is Mike, is Mike here? Mike Casey. You can be coming up a couple of people ahead of time just so you're ready to go. I'm Mike Casey, I'm gonna cede my time to Ricky Default. Thank you, Mike. Um, my name is Ricky Defoe, uh, R-I-C-K-Y-D-E, capital F-O-E, um, from the city of Cloquet. And we take a look out at this lake out here, Ojibwe call it, Gitche Ojibwe Gaming, the great sea of the Ojibwe. Now, we talk about fealty. Who do you owe your allegiance to? Do you owe it to death, which is when we pollute, we continue to do these things that is proposed, or do you owe your fealty to life? Now we talk about who is in the, uh, the, the commissioners, who are the plutocrats, who are the kleptocrats, who are the bureaucrats, who do they owe their fealty to? We often wonder, and then we say, I, I was raised here in Duluth in the hillside, 35 years of my life, I know a little bit about a book. And in that book it says, the iniquities of the father will be met on by in the third and fourth generation, the kids. So I wonder about those things. Do we need to shine the light on those whose fealty it is about death? So we realize we are here about life, water. The mother earth is crying about all the damage from pillaging and the rape of our mother earth, life. We talk about a, a worldview. Mainstream Americans' worldview is dominion over all things, hierarchy of life, and an all-male transcendent God. And, and we know that the ambiguity, the, the conflict, the tension that is coming now is a reflection of those things that are unresolved because of the dysfunctional cosmology, a dysfunctional worldview. These folks, the state of Minnesota, owe their fealty to death. When we take a look at, when we're destroying 
waters such as pristine Lake Superior, who's known throughout the world, our planet, our Mother Earth, we have to begin to think in terms of life, not destruction. So we sound out to you is who do you owe your fealty to again? Anishinaabe have a worldview where all things are interdependent on one another. Our worldview is one that has the great mystery in the, in the, and then we come down to the star world and then the moon, the sun, and finally to our mother earth. And on our mother earth, we have orders of things. Ten. We have, we have orders of things, the rock nation, the plant nation, the animal nation, and last man. We can't live without them. They can live without us. Time. Jim? Jim Sanford? My name is Jim Soffer. I was born and raised in Minnesota. I'm a veteran. I spent many, many days hunting and fishing in northern Minnesota. My family, my son has a home on Lake Vermillion. Uh, I don't think anybody appreciates the land, the water, the trees, and nature any more than I do. I spent all the time hunting and fishing, and I love it up here. However, we do have a need. It was several years ago when we were at war with, uh, in Europe and in, and in the Pacific, and it was the ore that came out of our hills here that uh, really probably saved this country and making the planes and the tanks and the ships and everything that was needed for our military to be successful. Today we're still at war. We have people in this world that would like to put away with our entire way of life. And with the rocket boy now and his little rocket with a atomic bomb on it, he could hit our nuclear, oh, shake your head. He could hit our, 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 our electrical grid and he could put us all out in no time. We can't let that happen. War today, or our military today, uses a lot of new technology. We have unmanned aircraft. We have uh, satellites. We have uh, all kinds of computers. Just about every part of the military industry uses technology and computers to, uh, for, their, uh, for their efforts. And so it is our obligation to provide them with the materials that they need to be successful. And that's all the special precious metals that we have here under our feet today. We do not want to buy it from overseas because that's exactly what will happen. We have it here, let's use it. God bless the military men and women today. God bless the mining industry in northern Minnesota. And God bless the USA. Thank you. Tanya. Tanya Kittleson. Hi there. I'm Tanya Kittleson. I'm with the Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. Thanks for letting us speak tonight. OK. Um, we strongly urge you to reject the polymet northmet sulfide ore mine proposal permits that are in front of you right now. You're considering some pretty serious stuff, so I appreciate your critical review of it. You asked us to, content, asked us to comment on content that is new or unresolved at this state, and there are a few that I'm going to list right now. One is that I ask you to require polymet to use the best available technology for storing mine waste, and that would be dry stacking. That's currently the industry best standard for um, storing mine waste versus a, storing it in a liquid form, a kind of a waste slurry that's stored behind an earthen built dam. Uh, these, the earthen dams are actually um, old technology and are the main reason why so many sulfide ore mines have seriously polluted in the past. Polymet has promised to use best industry standards uh, and dry stacking is recommended. So the permits you are currently considering allow polymet <laughs> to use the old technology. Another is given that acid mine drainage from polymet mine dam that collapsed in 2014, that pollution traveled 400 miles. And I mentioned this last night in Aurora, but it's worthy of repeating here. Um, 
I'm asking that you determine how far that, that acid mine drainage pollution will travel into Lake Superior. From where, we're, from where the PolyMet mine sits, if you go 200 miles downstream, you get to our lift bridge, which is just outside of the deck here. And another 200 miles past that goes out into Lake Superior, and that's 400 miles. So maybe PolyMet mine pollution goes not quite that far, maybe it, maybe it goes farther. But uh, as citizens of the state, I think we deserve to know how far that reach of contamination extends before you make a decision. Um, I re request that you require an updated financial analysis. The last one was done in 2008. It's been 10 years, and no one, not, and no one should, and no one, including the state of Minnesota, should make a decision based on 10-year-old financial information. Lastly, I request that you require PolyMet to prove it can capture and collect 90% of its wastewater before you make a decision. No, no other metal mine has ever captured 90%, um, let alone suggested that they could. Mines usually promise high and perform low, meaning they usually promise 60 to 80% capture rate, but fall short of their promises by about 25 to 30%. PolyMet plans to use the same technology that other mines have used, nothing new, nothing better, yet it claims it will achieve what has never been achieved before. So please reject the permit application and require proven technology be used to capture and collect 90 percent of wastewater. Ten percent of billions of gallons of waste is bad enough. It's too much pollution to allow into our public waterways. Please do not allow more than that. Thank you. Time. Jacqueline, just let me know that some people are having trouble hearing and back. So if you're speaking, you really got to get yourself up there into the microphone. All right. Philip, you ready to go? Philip Knudsen. Philip is not present, so we'll move on to Paula Maccabee. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. I'm Paula McAbee, the Advocacy Director for Water Legacy. I live in St. Paul, but Water Legacy is based in northeastern Minnesota. All of our board members either were born in or live in northeastern Minnesota. I'm a bit of a technical person, so I'm going to focus on some specific technical issues in the permit to mine and the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency pollution, water pollution permit. And based on the technical information that I've read, I believe the polymet copper nickel mine threatens Minnesota waters, downstream property owners and communities, the St. Louis River, Lake Superior, and Minnesota taxpayers. Now you need to know that even if everything goes as planned, the polymet mine project would result in over 15 million gallons per year of untreated contaminated pollution seeping into Minnesota groundwater and from groundwater into wetlands and streams. Polymet's mine pits, its tailings waste, and its waste rock piles, that's permanent, all have no liners underneath, and they would seep contaminated water for centuries, if not forever. When the Minnesota DNR said back in March of 2016 that Polymet's environmental impact statement was quote unquote adequate, it relied on claims made by Polymet that it would capture more than 90%, no, no, more than 99% of the polluted seepage at its tailings waste site. Now, PolyMet's claims were based on phony modeling. The only examples they gave of an unlined tailings dam was the tar sands tailings dam, which since then has resulted in billions of dollars of cleanup in Canada. Now, so PolyMet used phony modeling, and we were hoping we'd see the DNR put in their conditions that no permit to mine unless you keep the promise and prove that you've captured over 99% of the pollution. But the DNR does not have any conditions for seepage capture, and PolyMet can break its promises without consequences. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency draft water pollution permit is just as weak. The MPCA wouldn't limit pollution through groundwater that seeps up into wetlands and streams and harms water quality fish or wild rice. In fact, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency doesn't even propose to monitor at those really close by wetlands and streams. So polymet could pollute Minnesota surface water for decades with acid mine drainage, sulfate and toxic metals and no one would be the wiser. That is not what we want 
from either the DNR or the PCA. We are counting on you to protect us. Now here's something even more dangerous for any of you who live downstream. The DNR permit turns a blind eye to another huge risk, the threat that Polymet's dirt dams that are supposed to hold back tailings waste would collapse. Polymet is only being required to put up $10 million for what could be hundreds of millions of dollars in liability. Time. Thank you. Kristen Larson. Hi, I'm Kristen Larson with Friends of the Cloquet Valley State Forest. And speaking for me today is Jan Kehoe. And Jan is the township supervisor of North Star Township. Hi, yes, my name is Jan Kehoe. I'm a wetland scientist and a past president of the Society of Wetland Scientists. Um, I'm going to speak today um, in, uh, con with concern about the permit to mine. OK, I'm short. <laughs> um, a couple things. First of all, the wetland loss around the mine has been uh, grossly underestimated in the um, um, narrative document. Um, because the analog model that was used um, has scientific flaws through analysis of a bedrock type that's not present there. And so I think that the um, damage to wetlands around the mine will be much greater in scope and geographic area, um, and, and that's a concern. The second uh, concern I have is that the um, construction of the mine and operation will result in a 1,000 acres of wetland loss that will not be replaced because um, the mitig mitigation bank that's planned to be used, that is the superior mitigation bank, is compro comprised um, of largely of healthy wetlands. And so um, the peatland types that the mine will destroy um, will not be restored in the mitigation area. They'll be, the, the credits for mitigation are going to be comprised entirely of preserving natural wetlands. So this results in a total loss of 1,000 or even more acres of wetlands overall during the project. So I'll be very brief. I'd like to ask the DNR and the MPCA to deny the permit until they can show that there will be a no net loss of wetlands. Thanks. Catherine Kohlmeyer, ready to go? Is that mic ready to go? We're switching it out so you can be heard. I'm Catherine Kohlmeyer, and I cede my time to Rich. My name is Rich Staffan, uh, R-I-C-H-S-T-A-F-F-O-N. I'm speaking for the Duluth chapter of the Isaac Walton League. I can remember when the lower St. Louis River in Duluth was an industrial wasteland. It was not fishable, swimmable, or drinkable. Thanks to the Clean Water Act and after spending nearly half a billion dollars, the river has been restored to the point that it is now an economic asset rather than a liability for Duluth. It does not seem consistent policy to us to spend so much money to clean up the lower river and then issue permits to create an industrial wasteland in the headwaters. Copper and other minerals are valuable for our economy and society, but they're not more valuable than water. Water is essential to everything we do. Protecting watersheds is how we safeguard our water. The land where Polymet wants to build their mine was purchased with the Weeks Act for the very purpose of protecting the headwaters of the St. Louis River. It defies common sense that we can sustain this watershed while building a toxic mine in the midst of the headwaters. This is a forested, swampy, stream-laden landscape, an ill-suited place for Minnesota to experiment with the risky business of copper mining. If it is so important that we mine these minerals, the permit should at least require polymet to use the best available technology, such as dry stacking of tailings, rather than storing them in a flooded tailings basin that we know will leak into surface and groundwaters, and if the dikes fail, send a slurry of contaminated water right into the river. One of the duties of DNR is to promote the mining of our state's minerals. Because of this bias to support mining, we ask that a contested case hearing be held as a check to make sure the facts around copper nickel mining are complete and accurate. And as a check on the safety of the mine itself, we ask that the permit require that all employees who mine transport and process the ore be regularly monitored for the uptake of pollutants. They are the canaries in this mine, and monitoring their health would be the best way to determine if standards are being enforced and are actually protecting the workers and our environment. Finally, 
We're especially concerned about the way industry and our state legislature has been able to thwart the enforcement of existing water quality regulations. What good are these permits if they will not be enforced? We recommend that before mining, Minnesota should consider recycling copper as a better way to meet our needs for this metal. There's no shortage today. We believe it would be prudent to not issue a mine permit at this time, leave these minerals in the ground, and wait until mining technology has advanced so we can mine them safely. It is time for somebody to stand up and just say no. Ten. Thank you. Hi, Janet Draper. Janet, go ahead. I'm Janet Draper, and I'm ceding my time to my wonderful city councilor, Gary Anderson. Thank you. Commissioner Landwehr, Assistant Commissioner Naramore, and other folks here tonight, and people in the audience, and it's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be able to speak with you tonight. Um, as you know, we've been working on building a relationship um, with you as a city councilor from the city of Duluth. Um, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to see you here in Duluth tonight and see um, the support um, and the trust that the people of this area have in the DNR. I'm not an expert in anything, and I'm sorry that I can't speak to the technical aspects, but I'll gratefully use my two minutes remaining to say that I believe that the draft polymet permit to mine does not protect the public interest. It puts people downstream at risk and leaves taxpayers unprotected. As drafted, the polymet permit to mine doesn't protect Minnesotans and should be rejected by the Minnesota DNR. I read the mission statement of the DNR. The mission of the Minnesota DNR is to work with citizens to conserve and manage the state's natural resources, to provide outdoor recreation opportunities, and to provide for commercial uses of natural resources in a way that creates a sustainable quality of life. And to put things re in plain English, I have to say, how the heck does creating a draft permit to mine with polymet that includes filtering polluted water for 500 years, how does that add up to a sustainable quality of life? The description of the uh, mission statement goes on to say that the natural resources DNR works to integrate and sustain the inter interdependent values of a healthy environment and sustainable economy and livable communities. And I'm here to say tonight that I am holding you, the Minnesota DNR, accountable to this statement in all aspects, sustainable economy and living, livable um, communities. The people of Minnesota deserve this. Minnesota DNR has been held in high regard by Minnesotans for generations. And the time is now for, the, for you, Commissioner Landwehr and Assistant Commissioner Naramore, to live up to the shared values of all Minnesotans. DNR Commissioner Landwehr, use your discretion to call for a contested case hearing on the permit to mine prior Ten. to approval. Thank you. Craig Olson, available? Craig Olson? You, Craig? Great. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight. My name is Craig Olson. I am president of the Duluth Building and Construction Trades Council. We represent approximately 16 or 6,000 men and women that work in the construction industry in this region. Many of them are here tonight. And I want to thank my brothers and sisters from the Building and Trades Movement to be here and be here with PolyMet and to stay strong with us through this process. The state has thoroughly re reviewed the North Met project and the PolyMet has proved that the project permit conditions protect Minnesota's environment while creating hundreds of living wage jobs in the area, in the state that really needs them right now. Northeastern Minnesota has the potential to be a global powerhouse for responsible strategic metals mining. The North Met project will bring new life to an idle taconite plant and mine. With this new life, 
the region will rebound. Communities will grow, jobs will be created. It's estimated that 650 construction workers will be employed on this project alone. And an additional 350 jobs in operations once the mine is open. Estimates are that there's 200 or 2 million hours of construction, 2 million hours. This is equivalent to the Minnesota Twin Stadium in Minneapolis. Think about the good jobs that were created when the new stadium was built. There's no better time or place to build a mine. The North Met ore body is part of a world-class resource. It's located in the middle of a mining zone where mining has occurred for more than 135 years. We have the trained workforce, the existing roads, the rail, the piping, the power, the tailings, dams, and other infrastructure already in place. I, along with my union brothers and sisters, have been waiting a long time and, quite frankly, have been waiting long enough. It's time for the state to finalize and issue the permits so we can get these projects underway and get our people back to work. Thank you. Lynn Picard. I think so, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Lynn. Uh, good evening. My name is Lynn Pickard, L-Y-N-N-E, P-I-C-K-A-R-T. Tuesday night, a lot of us went to the caucuses, right? A lot of us went to the caucuses. Yes, we did. We did our civic duty. We participated. We brought up sulfide mining. <clears throat> and uh, we presented resolutions against sulfide mining. Of course, a few folks at our uh, caucus didn't like that. And one lady pointed out that it isn't called sulfide mining. It's called copper nickel mining. I beg to differ. What Minnesota gets out of sulfide mining is sulfide slush, acid mine drainage that is full of mercury, arsenic, lead, asbestos-like fibers, toxic stuff. We get air pollution, gigantic waste piles, tailing pipelines, and 24-hour round-the-clock light and noise pollution. Most of the copper, nickel, platinum, cold, gold will go someplace else. Most of it will go to China. One of the folks at the caucus, this is a good place to go for information, said that we don't even need the copper here. Most of it can be recycled co copper. How about that? Minnesota gets big holes in the ground, as big as cities, as deep as forever. When they're all done in 20 years, what goes in those holes, I wonder? Water? Dirty water? Minnesota gets higher taxes to pay for the cleanup that they left behind. Long-term cost, contamination to fish and wildlife. Minnesota gets America's biggest polluting industry. I live in Duluth. I love Duluth. I actually moved here. But my spirit lives in the boundary waters waiting for me. Jody, is Jody Stark ready to go? Come up, Jody. My name is Jody Starch. I'm a local 49er and I'm from Manorville, Minnesota. I support PolyMet and defer my time to send. A little closer Tom. to the mic. I, I'm Jody Starch. I'm a local 49er and I'm from Manorville, Minnesota. I support PolyMet, defer my time to Senator Tom Bach. Good evening. Uh, I'm Senator Tom Bach. The PolyMet mine is, uh, will be in my Senate district. Thank you to all of the department people, uh, all of the PolyMet people that were not only employees but contractors that have persevered over a decade in going through this process. And I think uh, what we all need to understand is everything in life has some risk. So all of you that are, that, all of you that are concerned, all of you that are concerned about that, let me share a couple observations with you. I would bet you that in 1961, when NASA launched Alan Shepard into space, there was a whole lot of engineers that were very worried if he was going to come back. 
1962, when John Glenn orbited the Earth for the very first time, there were a whole lot of engineers worried about the risk of that capsule burning up on its way back uh, to the ocean. And when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, a lot of engineers really worried about whether that lunar module was going to reconnect and we were going to get him home safely. We all manage risk every day, some families more than others. I think of firefighters and policemen who every day when they go out the door in the morning, their family worries whether their loved one is going to come home at night. They manage risk. I think of all the immigrants that came here, and I was reminded of it today when I was in Babbitt at a funeral of Hazel Miller, whose family came to the Iron Range and bought a house in a potato field in Babbitt, the birthplace of Taconite. They raised six children there, and I learned today they have 22 grandchildren and 22 great-grandchildren, all made possible by a job in the mine. But those immigrants that came here before the Millers, and my grandmother, my great-great-grandmother was one of them. She came here from Finland. The family history is her family put her on a boat at 12 years old to come to America for the opportunity to live in America. A great deal of risk. And now let me just conclude by saying all of you in blue hats, and especially those of you who I saw pictures in the Musaba Daily News today, young people wearing blue shirts, dream big just like they dreamed big when iron ore mining started in Minnesota and we ended up winning two world wars. Dream big that someday we build the factories that make the pipe and make the wire and the range is reborn. Because it can be done, but it will not be done without some level of risk because everything in life carries some risk. Thank you. Time. Anna, my name is Alyssa. My name is Alyssa Hoppy and I cede my time to Henry Mott. My name is Alyssa Hoppy and I cede my time to Henry Mott. Good evening. I'm Henry Mott. I'm professor of environmental engineering at St. Cloud State University, formerly of the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. I've 35 years where I've been following environmental systems and I think I've figured out how things move in environmental systems. Um, this closure plan that PolyMet has proposed is fatally flawed. We look at history, um, and, 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 and there's 57 metal mines in 15 states right now that are producing acid rock drainage, and they will produce that acid rock drainage in perpetuity. They've used 1950s technology, and it just doesn't work. They've left rock piles on the surface. They've left um, processing pits open on the surface. They've left high walls, and they left pits open to fill with acid rock drainage. PolyMet's plan is not that much different. Um, they want to uh, uh, dump waste rock in a pit, no isolation measures. That will be a problem in perpetuity. Uh, they want to leave um, processing waste in open pits on the surface. Murphy will have his way with that eventually. They want to cover waste rock piles with thin plastic membranes microbial activity, root penetrations, freeze-thaw cycles, will have those membranes looking like American flags that have been on flagpoles continuously for two years. So, and, and, and they want to leave a pit open. They want Minnesota's own version of Montana's Berkeley pit. pH 2.5, toxic groundwater, unsolvable in perpetuity. Okay, so what do we do? There's all these blue hats over here. There's all these orange flags over here. How can DNR bring those two groups together? They can say, now, in the future, if we're going to mine sulfide-bearing ore in Minnesota, we'll put the waste back into a repository. They can build that repository with an earthen barrier around its periphery. It'll take 5,000 years for water to get through that earthen barrier. They can put a lake on top of that repository. They can have that lake have organic sediments. Oxygen will never get in. No oxygen gets in. No acid rock drainage will ever be produced. Now, DNR 
There's lots of good rock. Let's grab some of that rock. Let's put some walleye spawning areas in that lake. Let's use the rest of the rock. Let's use the rest of the um, overburden. Let's create some topography on the rock, around the lake. Let's plant some trees. Ten. <laughs> Good timing. Anna? Anna Urbis? Hi, I'm Anna Urbis, and I'm a resident of Ely, Minnesota, and I support PolyMet, and I defer my time to Representative Rob Eklund. Good evening. I'm State Representative Rob Eklund, International Falls, Minnesota. Let me start with a few facts about copper and the everyday use that we have all become accustomed to. Automobiles have an average of 44 pounds of copper in normal and mid-sized cars. The average luxury and hybrid cars have 99 pounds of copper in them. The electric cars average 150 pounds and Tesla tops them all at 186 pounds. The average wind turbine contains six to seven thousand pounds per turbine. We've all been accustomed to the joys of doing our work through the new technologies of the modern world. I would venture to guess that the vast majority of the people present tonight have a smartphone in their pocket. Every smartphone contains more than 25 different precious minerals. Friends, it is really hard to be pro-green energy, but yet still be anti-mining. I'm a guy that likes to enjoy some of the great microbrews that our state has become so famous for. I also enjoy touring these places. If you ever take a tour of a microbrew operation, just take a quick look at all the stainless steel and copper that it takes to put together even a small microbrew op operation. These materials have to be mined somewhere. I would personally rather have them have the mining take place where we can be assured of the environmental standards that are the most stringent in the world and that the worker safety will be taken care of by the best labor standards anywhere. Thank you to the DNR and MPCA for holding this public hearing. I am in favor of this project moving forward. We have the strictest and most stringent environmental regulations of any state or country in the world. My view on this project is that it can be done through science and research and that we can safely mine copper and nickel and all the other precious uh, metals available in the Duluth complex. It should move forward. To deny this project will just make us more reliant on imports from third world countries that have little regard for environmental regulations or the working conditions of their employees. Again, thank you for this public hearing and I would like to close with a couple of thoughts. We won two world wars by mining on the Aaron Range. Let's take this mining one step further after the per permit to mine is issued, let's make this area the destination for industry that can further develop the copper and nickel resource. There is no reason that we cannot build the electric cars, wind turbines, microbrew vats that our new green economy is going to, be demand, going to demand right here in northern Minnesota where the resource, pride, and our great work ethic already exists. Thank you. Ten. Adam. Adam Lance. My name is Adam Lance. I work with Minnesota Industries. We support responsible mining and we support polymet. I would like to defer my time to Harry Melander. Commissioners, uh, good evening. My name is Harry Melander, uh, 353 West 7th Street, St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm here as the president of the Minnesota Building and Construction Trades Council's chair and a founding board member of Jobs for Minnesota. And I'm also here today like the orange and the blue because we all care about Minnesota. Our state has gone through a permitting process, a thorough permitting process for the PolyMet North Met project. We as Minnesotans trust the science and the findings of our state experts, which shows that this project will protect the Minnesotans and also our environment. About the builders, the skilled laborers, the men and women of the building trades who will build this project and meet and exceed all state and federal environmental requirements. To our rangers, the miners, a well-trained professional and a knowledgeable workforce that has more than 130 years of experience mining responsibly and taking care of our backyard. 
on the jobs. This project will create hundreds of job opportunities for workers to provide for their families and to bolster the economy of the Iron Range community and, and beyond. These job opportunities will, will bring well-paying, long-term, dependable jobs that are fit for highly skilled workers that are needed within this community. Additionally, PolyMet trusted the process that they were asked. It's invested millions of dollars because they agreed with the process and have followed through it. PolyMet has followed the state's strict regulatory reviews and permitting process. It has done everything that you and we have asked. I urge the MPCA, the DNR, to grant these permits in a timely manner. It's time for the state to finalize these permits and allow Minnesotans to get to work. Thank you. Bill, Bill Urzar? Is Bill available? Yes, I am. I'm right here. Oh, good you're evening. On, you're on the pink mic, sorry. <laughs> My name is Bill Urzar, E R Z A R. It's all right. Thank we'll you. go with it. It's okay. Go with it. I'm a lifelong resident of Ely in the Boundary Waters Canoe area around which Ely has always been a part. And I'm a former school board member in Ely who has seen our school population dwindle. I'm a proud Air Force veteran and a retired proud union steelworker I support PolyMet, and I defer my time to Lori Fito. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Lori Fito, L-O-R-Y-F-E-D-O, and I have been president of the Hibbing Area Chamber of Commerce for over 25 years. I've lived in or around mining communities my entire life, and I now live in French Township, just 30 miles north as the crow flies from the proposed PolyMet project. PolyMet has been under or has been in this process for half of my career and I'm kind of old. I strongly support the PolyMet project because I believe PolyMet will mine safely in our region. I believe in the strength of the environmental scientific community of our region and our in our industries. And more importantly, I believe in the people who are behind both. We have a track record of mining safely for more than a century and I believe we will continue to do so. Industry is continually innovating and must for to stay operational and relevant. Our community can be a part of this innovation. As we move towards using more sustainable energy sources, we will de depend heavily on, mine, on the mining industry to supply the materials we need. As consumers, we can derive these materials from overseas or we can produce them here. We have the metals, we have the resources, we have the workforce, we have the infrastructure. Polymet will be part of keeping this wealth in our communities, in our nation, and in our state. I also trust our state's regulatory agencies have done their job to analyze the project accurately and fairly, and PolyMed is working through the process outlined by these agencies. In time, it is time to move this project forward. Our chamber and all the northern chambers of commerce and the business community stand at the ready to help be a part of this exciting project that will strengthen our region and provide jobs for our people. Thank you. Laura Kircher. My name is Laura Kircher. I'm a lifelong Minnesota resident and a member of the grassroots group called Better in Our Backyard, which supports responsible economic industrial development that drives our economy in northeastern Minnesota. The state we're in tonight has some of the strictest environmental standards of any state. The regulatory process for the North Met project, which has been very thorough, shows that the company can meet and operate within these standards. Our area has been mining for over 135 years, and safety and the environment are at the forefront of our work. Better in Our Backyard rejects the notion that the copper, nickel, cobalt, and precious metals we all consume should only be sourced from countries that lack the laws, means, or will to protect their environment like we're capable of doing right here in Minnesota. As a Minnesotan and a resident of St. Louis County, the economic benefits cannot be repeated too much. 
The North Met project will create 360 full-time jobs. These are good, high-paying jobs that support families. This project will create secondary job needs, creating 600 additional opportunities for residents. Iron Range needs these jobs. They have the expertise and the available talent to fill these roles and inject energy into their communities. The county needs this project. St. Louis County will see $515 million in benefit. That has an incredible impact to schools, roads, and county services. I urge the MPCA and the DNR to grant these permits. Har Harvey? Harvey Van Horn? There you are. Harvey Van Horn. And I'm actually going to cede my time to Michael Fall. Thank you. That's spelled Michael Fau, P-F-A-U. And I appreciate the chance to speak to you tonight. Uh, the message I'd like to take to you is that the risk is too great. Any risk is too great. I've been inspired by the example in recent years of the water protectors who have taught us that water is life, that you can live without oil, even though it would be tough. You can even live without a cell phone, even though my daughter probably couldn't. But you cannot live without fresh water, clean water. And so I'd like to suggest to you today that we are extremely lucky here. Uh, Duluth, we look to the south and the east and we see the greatest freshwater sea in the world with 10% of the non-frozen freshwater on the planet. We look to the north and see a pristine wilderness of lakes, rivers, and streams. We are truly blessed. And if, as some serious thinkers say, that water in the 21st century is the new oil, then we are the Saudi Arabia of water. And we have a special duty to protect this resource. Now, if our water resources were to come under threat from terrorists wielding chemical weapons, every single resource of our government would be, would be levied against preventing that threat from coming to fruition. You know, if we could prove they were foreign terrorists, even the president might take an interest in protecting Lake Superior water. But I want to suggest to you today that Lake Superior is under threat from a chemical weapon of an even greater magnitude than could ever be wielded by any terrorist. The true chemical threat comes not from imagined foreign terrorists hungry for blood, but from foreign multinational corporations hungry for our minerals. The more than 200 million tons of toxic acid and heavy metal bearing waste generated by this mining proposal is a ticking time bomb. And it's not a matter of if it will go off, but when this time bomb will go off, sending millions of tons of toxic cargo straight down the St. Louis River toward Lake Superior. All parties agree, including the mining companies, on three things. First of all, hundreds of millions of tons of extremely toxic waste will be generated by the proposal. Second of all, it is so toxic that it must be permanently and totally contained. Third, it will be toxic for hundreds of years, perhaps, and any water even leaking from it has to be treated with a complex process. All parties agree to this. Where they disagree is the mining companies believe that this toxic slurry can be contained for hundreds of years. Opponents believe maybe not. The risk is there and the risk is too great. Now we're told that this time it will be different. That all of the previous times when this mining has destroyed water ecosystems after promises it wouldn't are exceptions. That that's the past that we have new technology, things are different now. But what is the new technology? As several speakers have noted, the new technology is a 40-year-old dam. Ten. That's right, the only thing separating us from 200 million tons of weapons-grade chemical materials is a two and a half mile long dam. Please, it's too risky, water is life. Time. I asked Michael, are you, s Michael, I have a question. Are you the same person who is at number 25? Okay, so we're taking number 25 down because you just spoke. All right, great. And Ray Skip Sandman? Go ahead. Ray Skip Sandman, S-A-N-D-M-A-N. I live right here in the Duluth, downstream from Polymet. Maintaining a clear water is necessary for our physical health and economic health. It is our responsibility to fight for our children and our rights uh, to have clean water to fish from and enjoy this beautiful Lake Superior that is in our backyard. Polymet is the largest threat to our region's supply of fresh water. To mine copper sulfide ore, the metal needs to be separated and finally crushed, uh, crushing sulfide bearing rock. When exposed, the sulfide creates acid which leaches into leaches several heavy me uh, metal, 
metals, <coughs> such as mercury and lead from the remaining waste rock. These heavy metals need to be contained to prevent them from getting into our air and our water. When the containment fails, and it will, uh, they'll leak heavy metals and then sulfates are released and then converted into methyl mercury in our rivers and enter our bodies when we eat the fish in, from the contaminated rivers. One in 10 newborns in Lake Superior Basin already have unsafe levels of mercury in their blood. This simply cannot add, <coughs> risk cannot be adding more mercury to our environment. Polymet plans to place a 250 tall and earthen dam on top of the existing LTV tailing pond to contain the toxin it produces. They believe that this containment will last for hundreds of years. Over those hundreds of years, it will nearly be impossible to prevent catastrophic flavor, failure of the containment and the pollution would work its way down the St. Louis River and in the Lake Superior. Additional, any environmental safeguards will be expensive to maintain and be abandoned eventually by PolyMet when they close the mine. It should be crystal clear to all of us that we will be left to deal with the mess. We cannot trust these companies to simply do the right thing. Plus, our current political power in Washington, D.C., and St. Paul is bent on eliminating environmental regulation and handcuffing our enforcement agents. Therefore, it would be in everybody's best interest to approach, would would, our best approach would never to be a left, law, never let PolyMet begin mining in the first place. PolyMet has been preying upon our desperate Ten. workforce by offering them exclusive jobs like a carrot on a stick. So let's understand fully they're only made there for profit. Time. Mary Thompson. Mary Thompson from Duluth. I cede my time to Virgil some. Hello, my name is Virgil Som, B-I-R-G-I-L-S-O-H-M. I'm from Tower, Minnesota. I'm here to represent seven generations of our people. I am an enrolled member of the Lake Superior Band of Ojibwe, and I have great concern for all of our grandchildren. I want to thank you, commissioners, representatives, people here with open hearts that are listening. We need to hear the truth. We need to get away from scientists that are leading us down a scorched path. When I go up to Lake Vermilion, when I go up to our land at Net Lake, which is a prime rising lake, I know that our grandfathers are continuing to watch over us, and they will continue to be here with us. We do not need a toxic environment. We need good wild rice. We need to be able to hunt moose. Our wolves need land to live on. I've driven by your polymet site many times. And I know the area. I know the way that the rivers flow through there in the creeks. And you do not have permission to have that water to flush out some crud that's in the ore and throw away 99% of it. Miigwech. Rachel Burroughs. Rachel, come on up. Hello, 
Rachel Burroughs from Duluth. I'm here tonight as a Duluth resident to speak for the protection of the water, to speak out against corporations and colonialism even when I've benefited from it. In the land of 10,000 lakes, we do not often think about water scarcity, but I think about seven generations and beyond and the world that we will leave behind for them. We can't drink poisoned water. Those future generations won't be able to drink poisoned water. And they should not have to pay corporations in order to have access to this life-sustaining resource. This corporation wants you to believe that, it's, that this project is about jobs. This company with foreign interests will close up shop and leave its mess behind for generations and few jobs. It's time to say no. I speak for the water. Water is life. The water sustain us. Mini Wakoni. Chris, Chris Erbus. Service, um, resident of Ely, Minnesota, born and raised. I support PolyMet and I defer my time to Tony Quillis. Good evening. My name is Tony Quillis, K W I L A S, and I am the Director of Environmental Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. First of all, I'd like to thank the Department of Natural Resources and the Pollution Control Agency for having this consolidated draft public hearing on the draft permit to mine, the draft air permit, the draft water or NPDES permit, and the 401 certification because this is a perfect example of one of the efficiencies that the Chamber has been asking for. Instead of having four separate public hearings, to have one consolidated hearing and we thank you for listening to us and having this is one just perfect example we think of an efficiency in the system. Second of all, I'd like to thank you for having multiple public hearings, which you didn't have to do and went above and beyond what was required in state law. But we thank you for doing that and especially having it in the region um, where the proposed project is located. Hearing from stakeholders that have daily interactions with this proposed project is invaluable. The environmental review and environmental permitting process has been adhered to um, by state statute and rule. Some will say, along with the chamber, that it's taken too long and cost too much, but no one can argue that this process has not been followed and closely adhered to. We have a tremendous opportunity before us to develop a world-class resource, the North Met Ore Body, and in turn capitalize on one of the largest economic development projects proposed in this state in recent years all while protecting the great natural resources that we all enjoy. This economic impact of this project is invaluable and could create over 600 construction jobs and 360 permanent jobs at the facility. There will be numerous auxiliary benefits also to local cities, counties, school districts, businesses, as well as to the state of Minnesota. In regards to the four permits, um, on the permit to mine, I'd like to thank the Department of Natural Resources, Commissioner Landwehr and Assistant Commissioner Laramore for your staff for putting together this document. I know it was no easy task. But the most important part of that permit to mine is the financial assurance provision. The financial assurance provisions assure that the state of Minnesota will be protected when the processing facilities in the mine are properly closed and reclaimed. It is important to note that this provision can be revisited yearly and adjusted by the state. In regards to the draft air permit, the company has, set, has met all the details required by the draft air permit. The potential emissions are identified and have set limits on those and they are legally enforceable. On the draft water quality permit Ten. or the NPDES permit, um, we thank you for establishing the specific limits and protection of surface and groundwater. But in the end, it is abundantly clear the process Ten. established by the state has been Emily? <laughs> Emily Norton, you're actually on the yellow mic. Oh, that's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. We skipped one because Michael had gone already, so go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, hi. My name is Emily Norton. I'm a citizen of Duluth. I am out here asking the DNR to oppose the permits to mine. Um, all the things the scientists have said. What's at stake here from the DNR standpoint is a pristine wilderness that we want to preserve, and I don't think we will regret 
preserving the wilderness, but we're probably going to regret the mining. Um, I would like to defer the rest of my time to um, Bridget Holdcomb, who will speak for Duluth for Clean Water. Thank you. My name is Bridget Holcomb, B-R-I-D-G-E-T-H-O-L-C-O-M-B. I'm from Duluth. Uh, this is my first sonnet, and I think it's appropriate that I wrote my first sonnet for public servants. Um, and I recognize that these public servants have enough flex in the law. You can make this decision either way. How much was hushed to get us to this day? How far would be the breaking point for you? Contort the draft and with it science lay, whatever reason facts tell us to do. You do your job but still reach to sleep fair, so keep the struggles with all laws concealed. Deep dives minutia of design and there, false sense of calm, kill qualms about the real. But what a lone soft voice resolved could say, no model holds the world and all its flaws. The thought of ground you stood and lives you changed be foremost on your mind retirement day. Before you lies a whistle and our home. Our eyes ask, who's the courage to say no? Thank you. Cindy, Cindy Whiting, over there. To do, to do what I can to protect our clean water. I would like all of you to think for a moment where any of us would be, jobs or not, without our clean water. I w and that goes to the risk representative Tom Bach. Where would you be without clean water? And if there is any further question on that, any of us could ask Cape Town, South Africa. I've been at this for a while, and I would like and encourage everyone to go online and Google some of the destruction that has happened by sulfide mining in Canada you will be astounded. Please, please do not allow this permitting to go forward. Clean water. I defer the rest of my time to Kevin Lee. Thank you. My name is Kevin Lee, the last name is L-E-E. -E. I've heard a lot today about uh, this project complying with the highest standards in the world, so I'd like to talk about that for just one minute. In 2015, there was a panel of expert mine engineers that issued a report that out outlined how we can learn from the mistakes of the past. Most of the mining industry listened. Polymet and Glencore have not. The first item on this expert's list, don't store mine waste with water. But Polymet won't listen. They want a permit to create a mine waste lake 900 acres large 250 feet in the air and keep it there forever. The Mining Indus Association of Canada, an industry trade group, now requires its members to have their mine waste practices audited by outside experts. Parliament won't do this. The government of British Columbia requires outside review of mine waste dam designs. Parliament does not. The Canada Mining Innovation Council says you need to make sure that surrounding communities have real-time access to water quality data. Parliament won't do this. Here in the States, the governments of Maine, Michigan, and New Mexico will not permit a mining operation that has to be maintained in perpetuity. Polymet's permit application says that maintenance and water treatment will, will be required forever. Montana not only requires that permits are reviewed by outside experts, they require that mine waste dams have what's called a factor of safety of at least 1.2. 10. Polymet allows 1.1, and when you get to 1, the dam collapses. We deserve better than this. Sally Munger.
I'm Sally Munger, and I'm uh, ceding my time to Gay Traxel. My name is Gay Traxel, G-A-Y-T-R-A-C-H-S-E-L. I'm from Duluth. <clears throat> I am a member of the League of Women Voters, Duluth Natural Resource Committee. We have a public policy position that states that we promote an environment beneficial to to life through the protection and wise management of natural resources in the public interest. Also, to preserve the physical, chemical, and biological integrity of the ecosystem, and to support measures to reduce pollution to protect surface water, groundwater, and drinking water. According to your own statements, the purpose of a permit to mine is to control the possible adverse environmental effects of mining by ensuring orderly construction and development of a mine, sound operational practices, and reclamation of mined areas. These are some of the things that I think have not been fully addressed with PolyMet. The design of the tailings basin is the cheapest and it has a history of failing. Pollution due to seepage can still contaminate the surrounding water and last for years, maybe forever. We don't know. How will PolyMet satisfy the 10 milligrams per liter sulfate standard when existing mines are not even being held accountable today? Reclamation is the act of returning something to a former better state. I see no path to this happening unless you believe what is in Butte, Montana, the nation's biggest body of toxic water from a flooded copper mine, the Berkeley pit, is reclamation. It is a super fund and is under the EPA's remediation, not the company that produced the toxic water. The latest decision by EPA Director Pruitt on Bristol Bay to protect salmon from copper mining, he states, it is my judgment at this time that any mining projects in the region likely pose a risk to the abundant natural resources that exist there. I would think that 10% of the fresh water in the world, Lake Superior, might deserve at least the same protection salmon fish are getting in Alaska. <laughs> the world's water Time. supply is dwindling due to climate change, pollution, and overpopulation. The only conclusion at this time is that sulfur copper mining poses too many risks Time. today. Dennis, good. Hi, my name is Dennis Good, and I would like to cede my time to Paula McAbee. I believe Paula already spoke. Is this true? Yeah, Paula already spoke. Oh, she. she you want to speak? Oh, she can't speak again. No, one one time per person. <laughs> How about Bob Tamman? Hmm. The, Oh, he gave his name to someone else. Okay. I'm Bob Tamman. I see times are flying, for which some will be grateful, but I'm from Sudan, Minnesota. Bob Tamman, T A M M E N. And I worked in the mines in Minnesota and as well, Upper Michigan, Montana, North Dakota. I've seen a lot of mining communities, and I don't see many healthy economies, I don't see many healthy mining communities. We don't know if we have any real benefit from mining in Minnesota at the state level. And no, you've asked for technical reasons to analyze this permit, so I would suggest that we need to do an adjusted net savings accounting. Now this is a widely used process when countries that depend on natural resources a lot of them are very poor. So you do an adjusted net savings accounting to see if the cost balance with the benefits. Now we know the cost of mining in Minnesota. 
about a quarter of a billion dollars to build the bridge over there at uh, Highway 53. We know that we rebate up to, it's been a quarter of a billion dollars or since 93, we rebate right back to the mining industry. So I think we should do that accounting. I don't believe the state of Minnesota should make the decision on mining without knowing if we're actually going to get a benefit for the great state of Minnesota. <coughs> And uh, the other thing I would mention that in the accounting, they account for mineral depletion and wetland destruction, carbon sequestration. There are a lot of costs to mining. So we're destroying wetlands for a little benefit. And I hate to think that I live in a state that would dynamite a cathedral to create a job salvaging bricks. Thank you. Henry Mott. Is Henry here? Over to the yellow board. Did he speak already? I heard somebody say. Thank you for your help. Um, Rose Hain. Is Rose ready? Rose, raise your hand if you're coming down. Okay, there she is. Come on down. And Lauren Sample, be getting ready. While Rose comes down. My name is Rose Haney, spelled R-O-S-E-H-O-E-N-E. -E -E. And I'm here to stand with the water and ask you to not permit this to happen. And I want to talk about it, seven generations, sustainability, and where that concept comes from. This is not a new concept. This is a very old concept. It originated with the Iroquois, the great law of peace from the Iroquois nation, the Haudenosaunee, who, by the way, our constitution is based on theirs. They talk about looking forward for our children seven generations. I wonder what it looked like here 500 years ago. Sometimes I like to daydream about that. And I wonder what it will look like 500 years from now. What Polymet is proposing 500 generations from now would be 25, 500 years from now would be 25 generations. The Haudenosaunee people in their wisdom were looking at seven. We need to go even beyond that at this point. We need to be thinking about not just us, immediate gain, jobs. I'm not against jobs. We all need jobs. We need to live. But not through the loss of water, because water really is life. And every single one of us needs to be thinking forward. One of the great leaders uh, of the Haudenosaunee, who, by the way, I lived with for many years, uh, a chief named Orrin Lyons, who's often quoted, he said, we're looking ahead as one of the first mandates given to us as chiefs and as people to make sure that every decision we make relates to the welfare and well-being of seven generations to come. What about the seventh generation? What about the 25th generation, 500 years from now? Where are you taking them? And where are you taking us? We also pulled the card uh, for Gary Anderson from Duluth, who we believe already spoke again. There's two Garys, let me know. Um, Lauren, thank you. I'm Lauren Sambolt from Duluth, Minnesota, and defer my time to Mark Giese. Hi, my name is Mark Giese. I'm not a person who GIESE. I'm not a person who would normally speak in public, but I will because we need to encourage everyone to support Polymet through the final stages of the permit process. I was born and raised in northern Minnesota. My wife and I decided to raise our family here too. I attended school in Aurora, so did our children. I've worked in the mines, as did my father, uncle, and great uncles. My family have all been avid outdoor enthusiasts. The last 30 years, I've resided on a small lake on the Embarrass River chain. 
It is located downstream of the old Erie and LTV mining site, which is the proposed site of the Polymet project. We use the lake to hunt, fish, kayak, boat, and swim. We also take trips into the boundary waters to enjoy the outdoors, pristine waters, and fishing. Contrary to what opponents of this project portray, residents in this area, including my family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, and customers, are all concerned about our environment. We've been mining in Minnesota to close to a century and a half. Our watershed is one of the cleanest in the nation. We also utilize some of the old mining pits in our region for water sources and recreational purposes. It is clean water because we live in a state that monitors mining activities. Companies are held responsible and not given the opportunity to jeopardize the environment without severe ramifications. Polymet has been thorough in following the governmental regulatory review through this long permitting process. The Polymet project will mine ore from the Duluth complex. It is a world-class resource of precious metals located in the midst of existing mining operations. It will produce metals that are essential to our lives. Appliances, electrical components, power plant equipment, dental instruments, and numerous necessary items are built with copper, nickel, platinum, and other precious metals. Metals that can be resourced locally by environmentally responsible mining. This is not the old sulfide extraction method often referenced by opponents, but a new technology which will make it possible to tap this valuable resource safely. Modern copper and nickel mines have shown they can operate without polluting and can comply with state and federal standards for protecting our air and water. There is no better place to construct this mine. Our region has a trained workforce, existing roads, rail, power, a tailings basin, and infrastructure to minimize the environmental impact as compared to starting a new greenfield operation. I believe organizations like the Clean Water Action Group are needed, but our region has the cleanest water in the state, and I believe it is because we are heavily regulated. The Clean Water Action Group should focus on protecting our lakes, streams, and rivers, and other regions of the state that currently have contamination issues and continue to protect our watersheds from exotic species. The Polymet Project will be monitored throughout the whole process, including construction, operation, and closure of the mine. In the permit to mine, there are financial assurance provisions to assure taxpayers are protected. I encourage everyone, including the opponents of this project, to examine the comprehensive permit conditions which have been structured to meet the strict environmental guidelines. Thank you for considering my comments. I urge the MPCA and DNR to conduct a timely review of the comments Ten. and issue the permits Parliament needs to produce the metals we use every day. Thank you. Alan, Alan Sternson. Is Alan here and ready to speak? All right, not seeing Alan, we'll move on to Mary. Mueller, Kyle, Kiel, Mary. Wave your hand if you're on your way down. Okay. Anya, thank you. Wave your hand for me, hi, thank you. My name is Anya, A-N-J-A, Chiriskis, C-U-R-I-S-K-I-S, and I'm Got someone who's actually prepared tonight. Uh, John Gappa. Good evening. My name is John Gappa, G-A-P-P-A. -P I live in St. Paul. I've served as a corporate chief financial officer, and I've been actively following the financial assurance aspects of this proposed project. I also serve on the board of the Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. Governor Dayton has stated that permitting the proposed polymet mine will occur only if it protects the taxpayers of Minnesota with adequate financial assurance. While the DNR's latest financial assurance requirements are much improved, they still do not provide the financial projections or protections that Minnesota taxpayers deserve. The DNR's analysis shows that the first year of mining creates a cleanup bill of $588 million. After 11 years of mining, the cleanup exposure is over a billion dollars. At the conclusion of mining, the remediation costs and the cost of treating polluted water for 100 years is $782 million. And these estimates assume that everything goes according to plan. To protect the taxpayers of Minnesota, I recommend that the DNR first significantly increase the upfront cash contributions required in the financial assurance package. As it stands, the total cash requirements by the ninth year of operation total $26 million, a mere 3% drop in a billion-dollar cleanup bucket. 
DNR's own consultants state that it would be very difficult for Polymet or even a major mining company to obtain the financial, in, in financial instruments required. Second, require Polymet to complete an updated definitive feasibility study examining the project's ability to meet the cash contribution requirements. This study should be subject to public review and comment, and information learned from the study should be incorporated into the final permit to mine. Polymet is proposed paying itself first by contributing only $2 million a year during the most profitable years of mine operation, while deferring its cleanup payments till after most of the productive ore is mined. By delaying the cash cleanup payments, the state runs the risk of Polymet privatizing the profits and socializing the costs of this project. Finally, if Polymet fails to meet any of its financial assurance requirements, the DNR needs the options to have, have needs options similar to all corporate credit agreements, which carry the following conditions. First, prohibit the payment of dividends to mine shareholders if the agreement if the financial assurance agreements are not being met. They should also prohibit the payment of bonuses, stock options, or other incentives to executives of the mine if the financial assurance is in default. And finally, require full cash funding of all financial insurance obligations in the event the mine is sold. In conclusion, and significantly more of the financial insurance package needs to be funded with cash rather than difficult to obtain financial instruments. To adapt an old saying, in God we trust, time. Polymet, please bring cash. Blanche? Is Blanche Wilcox? Is Blanche here and ready to speak? Hi, my name is Blanche Wilcox, and I defer my time to J.T. Haynes. Hi, my name is J.T. Haynes. I live in Duluth, and I'm a volunteer with Duluth for Clean Water. I spent some of my early years growing up on the Iron Range in Mountain Iron. I have very fond memories of growing up in Mountain Iron. Um, the basic comment I want to make today is that uh, those of us in this area, we live downstream of this proposal. And as such, I think the, the very serious concerns you're hearing from downstream communities need deserve special respect. Um, I have three brief comments about the permits. First, as you know, medical professionals around the state have called for a health impact assessment on this project to measure cumulative impacts to humans. That study has not happened. I view this as a failure in the process and something the draft permits do not adequately address. Second, the U.S. Forest Service recently found that 28% of dams for this type of mining fail in the U.S. That rate is unacceptable in a water-rich environment. Since this process began, agencies have updated climate data, which confirms increasing frequency of heavy precipitation events in our area. My understanding is that these draft permits do not address the increased risk of dam failure to downstream communities. That is clearly a failure in this process. Third and finally, there has been no emergency response planning education with downstream communities like Fond du Lac, like Cloquet, Esco, Duluth, and others. The threat of dam failure is high, and the threat of spills and leaks is essentially 100%. It is unconscionable that downstream communities have not been educated and informed about dam failure rates, inundation analysis, and emergency response planning. How has that not happened? This is a fundamental failure in the process, and the permits should be denied on that basis alone. This has been a long process, but I think it's important that we remember. Are we okay here? Sure. Take a quick pause. We'll set your timer again. Yep. Everybody okay? Charlie, you all right? Someone tripped. It's okay. okay. We don't want to interrupt your speaking time, so we'll... Thank you. I'd just like to acknowledge this has been a long process, but I think it's really important, commissioners, that we recall that this is the moment of decision, and, and it, it's, uh, it's required of all of us, at elected officials and commissioners, that we give this a fresh look with the final details now. I expect you to do that. And I want to say I regret that my advocacy for the children of this area feels like advocacy against the children from my old hometown. That is not my intent. I like to think as Minnesotans we could agree that if our jobs harm or threaten our neighbor's children, as painful as it might be, maybe those aren't the right jobs. <laughs> Glencore is not a good company. They have a horrible record of mistreating labor and the environment. I think it's obvious they would say anything for profit. 
I do not trust them. I don't think anyone in here should trust them either, blue hat or orange scarf. Commissioners, we believe this process has failed in fundamental ways, especially with regard to downstream communities. I urge you to reject the permits. If this goes forward, I believe we will have sold Minnesota to the lowest bidder and nothing would ever be the same again. We need a better option. Thank you. Is it John, is John Fido available? John Fido. John's gone, thank you for your help. Uh, Corey Northrup? Looking for Corey, no? Corey, all right, thank you. Is, is this wine supposed to stand? Okay. Yeah, it's okay. The yellow one? Yellow one. Okay. Yeah, the yellow one's getting kind of underused, so thank you. <laughs> Larry's lonely over there. Or underused yellow microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so when do I start? You tell me, like, go. We'll start, say your name oh, and, okay. and city, and we'll start when you start speaking. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Corey Northrup, K-O-R-I-I -I Northrup. Uh, I come from the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Um, I live over there on the reservation. Um, I've been there about four years, but I was born and raised in Duluth. So, you know, obviously Duluth has a big part of my heart. Um, I've heard a lot of people talk today about 500 years from now. And I stand here in front of you as sort of a relic of 500 years from the past. 500 years ago, we didn't worry about poisoned water. We didn't worry that we would not have enough wild rice to feed our families. We didn't worry about game. We came here to our promised land, the Anishinaabe people. You know, not just my reservation, but across all of mining country, not just in this state, but in other states as well. You know, 500 years ago, we all lived together communally, and we looked out for each other, and there was no such thing as profit. And, you know, to me, I'd like to get back to that you know, where we all are living in the promised land again and we're all snowshoeing and hanging out and going fishing and, you know, telling each other stories and stuff. Because, like, to me, that's a better, you know, use of our time than having to come to meetings and hearings and judges and, you know, things of that nature. You know, I'd rather share my last dollar with a stranger than say, I need a prophet. I don't need a prophet. I need to help my fellow man. I need to be here to share this beautiful place, this beautiful life with everyone around me. And, you know, 500 years in the future, I would like it to go back to the way it was 500 years in the past. So, thank you for listening. Miigwech. So Beth, Beth Blick. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, my name is Beth Blick, it's B-E-T-H, and Blick is B-L-I-C-K. I'm from Oak Park Heights, from the Twin Cities, and I urge this uh, commission uh, to uh, uh, put a damper on not, uh, on, on not putting a license on out uh, for, for, uh, you know, for this company, because you know, uh, water is life, and we need uh, better alternatives for jobs. And and I think you know what's going on, you know, uh, is a cop out, and and we just can't have it. Uh, there there are much better things, and and I keep thinking too much about what took place in out in uh, Detroit, Michigan, well, not in Detroit, but in Flint, Michigan, when, uh, w when all the w water went poisonous, and people cannot live on poisonous water. That, that is not good. That just isn't good. And, and we need better than that. Pe people don't, don't deserve uh, this. Again, water is life. James Kramer, come on up. Good 
Hello, my name is James Kramer, K-R-A-M-A-R. -A I'm a resident of White Lakes, Minnesota, and I support Polymet and defer my time to Peter Haynes. Hello, my name is Peter Haynes. I'm the CEO of GPM, a 40-year-old uh, pump company located in Duluth. We manufacture the world's toughest submersible slurry pumps. They're cased in cast iron. They're loaded with copper wound motors and alloy steels that contain copper and nickel. Uh, we support over 50 families, families regionally and over 1,000 families if you factor in our 48 North American distributors and our global marketing partners. We all support mining. Today started like it does pretty much every day for me and likely how it started for everybody that's here in the audience tonight, whether you support PolyMet or not. My alarm went off at 5.30. And I was thankful for the electricity provided by Minnesota Power. When shutting off my alarm, I noted my house was warm, and I was thankful for Como Oil delivering propane produced at an oil and gas refinery so I can heat my home. I went to the kitchen, turned on the water, and made my wife coffee, and was thankful to the water treatment plant for providing water at the turn of a spigot. I then visited the bathroom, and after flushing the toilet, was thankful for our local wastewater treatment plants and their processing abilities. I opened the fridge and I selected the food and beverage that I wanted for breakfast, and was thankful I live in the USA, home of the world's most efficient and effective farmers. I showered, I dressed, I drove through the frigid cold to work and was thankful that core human ingenuity in businesses allow my family to live and reside in northern Minnesota. The fact is I'm happy to live in a house. Most of you probably don't realize that a typical home, single family home, 2,100 square foot, uses 439 pounds of copper. Like it or not, if you live in a house, an apartment, a mobile home, or any type man-made dwelling, then by default, you support copper and nickel mining. Everything you use every day is manufactured and produced by equipment that's made from steel alloys that contain varying fractions of copper and nickel. That means if you consume electricity, use natural gas or propane, turn on a faucet for water, eat food or beverage products that you've purchased, if you flush a toilet, ride a bike, drive a car or a truck, by default, you support copper and nickel mining. Unless you're living off the grid, off the land, and walk everywhere you go in handmade everything, by default, you support copper and nickel mining. Minnesota surpasses all states in protecting and leveraging our natural resources. From a first personal standpoint, the Boundary Waters are as pristine and fresh today as they were the first time I went there with my dad 50 years ago. If you live in Minnesota, ten. You need to support PolyMet. You need to support mining. You can't live as you do today without copper and nickel metals that PolyMet. Or Alan. Would Alan Anderson? Is Alan available? Alex. Does Alex have it? Okay. Don't hesitate to come up before your turn so we can keep going quickly. Hello, I'm Al Anderson from uh, Hermantown, Minnesota. I'm not much of a speaker, but I got to say what I need to say. Um, Let's get a little closer to the mic. I'm Al Anderson from Hermantown, Minnesota. Um, I hunt fish in this area. I I'm grateful for the miners, for what you did in the past, for making steel and everything for the wars we went through. But this is a different animal, with sulfide mining. Sulfide mining, you gotta make the dams, whatever, the last 500 years, whatever. And I talked to these people out here, and they said, oh, there's gonna be a 255 berm? I didn't know that. They're DNR people. Am I supposed to trust these people? I'm not sure. I went through the, what, the school trust land thing back about four or five weeks ago. And I said, is this land gonna be for mining or anything? Well, yes, it was. They didn't tell me that. They are dishonest with me. Don't trust them. Because I found out a couple weeks later, uh, Twins Metals had interest in it. 
Did I know that? Were they honest with me? No, they put a facade on. I don't trust a DNR. I used to, not no more. Now my thing is, water is precious. When I grew up, population of the United States was 225 million. Now it's 325 million. So water should be more precious resource in the long term. More people. Very precious. We need water. We're downstream living in Duluth area, St. Louis River. It's going to be polluted, heavy metals. We have more rains. We got heavy rains. I think 1970s we had a 10 inch rain. Back a few years ago we had 10 inch rain. Those dams going to hold? I think not. I'm pretty good at stats. And I can, you could crunch the numbers. Is these dams going to hold for 500 years, 200 years? I rather doubt it. In Butte, Montana, they got that mine up there. It's a hazardous race. It's a super fund. They can't clean it. They tried to clean it. In uh, Canada there, British Columbia, had the brand, the dam break up there. More pollution. Can it be fixed? No. Once it gets deep in aquifers, you can't clean it. How can you do that? Minnesota's going to be stuck with a Superfund site eventually. What, what can we do about it? Taxpayers will be held holding the bag. These corporations, if they got too much to sue too much, they'll go bankrupt. Who's holding the bag then? We've seen that happen many times. I don't know what to do. I'm just putting my word out here. I'm not much of a speaker, like I say, but I know what's wrong. I know what's right. But I'm grateful for the miners, what they did in the past. But this is a different animal, as I said. Thank you. Alex, and if John Doberstein, David Ivanen, come on up to the front so we're ready to go. We're at Alex now, and then John, you're next. Thank you. Thanks for coming on up and being ready. Go on. Hello, my name is Alex Havron. I'm a resident of Duluth, um, Sheet Metal Local 10. I support Polyumet, and I defer my time to Mike French. Good evening, my name is Mike French, and I'm a civil engineer with LHB here in Duluth, and I'm here to speak as a member of the consulting engineering and environmental services community and for the industrial clients that I have the privilege of serving. There are many passionate voices speaking tonight, and those that have spoken for many nights over many years now on this topic. To that lengthy conversation, I'd simply like to add my own three points. One, as an engineer, I'm a big fan of process. That is, following rules, procedures, and the implementation of guidelines and best practices. Guidelines and rules are important in that they take the guesswork out of problems. Not controversy, but they take away the randomness. It is in this mindset that I wish to voice strong support for the approval and completion of Polymet's permit to mine on the basis of following the procedures. Mining is a significant part of our shared heritage in Minnesota. And I have to say that I've only been a Minnesotan since 2004, so in my 14 years of, of being a Minnesotan, I've never known a period when Polymet wasn't working on getting their permit. It's quite a time. As time has progressed, the rules and standards that administer mining continue to evolve, whether on the matter of worker safety or environmental impact mitigation. We have state agencies and federal agencies that establish and enforce standards and lay out a clear path for reviewing and issuing permits. If an enterprise like Polymet is committed to following the rules, to funding its environmental commitments, to ensuring worker safety, then it needs to be allowed to engage in that business. In the absence of following our own established rules, how is any enterprise to have confidence that they would want to locate in Minnesota? I believe our permitting and review process is robust and it works. It's time to end the debate and move forward with the permit to mine. Two, I support allowing Polymet to advance their project as it relates to the benefits of improvements to regional infrastructure. We've heard many calls for approving this project on the basis of jobs, and I absolutely agree. But heavy industry like Polymet supports us in many ways. Its industry supports the expansion and protection of our harbor with products coming in and out. Heavy industry like Polymet supports the construction and safety of rail. 
Heavy industry like Polymet supports education and research like that at NRRI. And, how, and heavy industry like Polymet supports a robust electric infrastructure, uh, providing significant reliability for which all Minnesotans benefit. Thank you. John and David Ivonen and Kate Harrison, come on up if you're ready to go. Go ahead. Thank you so much. My name is John Doberstein. I will proudly defer my time to Libby Bent. Hi, I'm Libby Bent, um, downstream resident of Duluth, and I oppose the issuance of any permits. As my father observed, the sheer complexity of the chemistry, hydrology, and geology involved in sulfide mining without irreversible pollution in our water-rich environment boggles the mind. It's never been done because the cost would be huge, far in excess of the value of extracted metals. A more far-fetched industrial initiative is difficult to imagine. So what is going on? How did this plan make it past a federal law designed to protect watersheds, headwaters on Forest Service land? A state law requiring sulfide mines to be maintenance-free on closure and treaty rights to hunt, fish, and gather on ceded territories requiring high biodiversity lands. Why was the call for a health impact assessment ignored, even as 30,000 health professionals requested one? Why are warnings from mining engineers that the tailings basin's design is risky and unsafe going unheeded? The proposed upstream design to store a slurry of toxic mine waste on top of unstable wetland soils is a Mount Polly recipe for disaster. The Mount Polly review panel warns, it is not enough to tweak around the edges of what we've been doing. We cannot continue to use technology that is fundamentally Hold on, hold the timer. Turn the mic. The mic just cut out. It, time was not up. No. no, I know that. In the back, the mic just cut out. Should I go over there? Tested is okay. <laughs> little break while you take a jog. Okay. Is that one working? Give it a test. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, all right. These are not problems of the past. Dam failures are increasing, Time. and PolyMet has not analyzed the increased risk of dam failure from higher precipitation events due to global warming. Perhaps most troubling, where is the analysis of the value of one of the world's largest freshwater deposits? Water is becoming desperately scarce worldwide. Forty states could face clean water shortages in the next ten years. This decision will broadcast Minnesota's priorities. Do we embrace a blue economy and lead the way in mining landfills for strategic metals and investing in copper and precious metal recycling? Or do we trade multi-billion gallons of our fresh water every year for deposits containing less than 1% minerals, transforming our lake country into a sea of toxic waste? The rest of the world is choosing. El, Sal El Salvador prizes water over gold, saying we are the first country to evaluate the costs and benefits of metallic mining and say no. Buffalo, New York is transforming their city from rust to blue, embracing an economy based on the Niagara River and Lake Erie. And Minnesota, 50 years of cleaning up the St. Louis River, river only to become the land of sky-tainted waters. As my dad would say, it boggles the mind. This decision is irreversible. For our future and for the greatest lake in the world, we cannot get it wrong. Please do not check one more box. Please reject these permits. Ten. David, Ivanin, and then if Kate Harrison and Lauren Laurel Melby, I'm apologizing if I'm getting your names not quite right. David, <laughs> David go for it. Uh, like many of the other people here, uh, I'm not really accustomed to public speaking, but. Um, this is an issue that's really tough for me. I grew up on the Iron Range. Chisholm, uh, grandfather drove or engineered trains from the range to the Superior area. Uh, another grandfather worked in the underground mines, the pioneer near Ely. Spent a lot of time in and around the Boundary Waters. I've seen it transform people's lives. I've seen it bring people from different socioeconomic backgrounds together. Um, but. <coughs> Dollars to donuts, bottom line, water is more, pressure than cop more precious than copper. We need it. We do need copper. We have other ways to get it currently. Um, we have companies with bad track records. Glencore um, should 
the twin metal mines follow, we've got Antifagasta, even worse. If you let this abomination in our door, please make sure they put down at least a half a billion deposit with most of their profits paying for the rest of it year after year. Is Kate Harrison here? They're working on the pink mic, so Kate, make your way over to the yellow mic. Thank you. Kate Harrison, AJRR is one. I'd like to read a statement from Rebecca Otto, state auditor and candidate from governor on the Polymet draft permit to mine. The, the draft Polymet permit to mine allows Polymet to store mine waste in a dangerous, outdated way that puts people and water downstream at risk. I oppose the draft permit for PolyMet sulfide mine proposal because PolyMet has not listened to the public and experts who oppose the dangerous way it stores mine waste. And the hundreds of years of pollution and the over one billion that is at stake. The draft permit sets a one billion figure needed to reclaim the site and pay for long-term water treatment during the middle of the proposed mining However, reliance on bonds PolyMet has not proven they can acquire, failure to require PolyMet to update their financial feasibility study, and the low two million per year required contributions to the long-term water trust fund in the first half of the proposed mine mean taxpayers are not protected. The draft permit assumes PolyMet will achieve an impossible level of capturing polluted water and use reverse osmosis water treatment for at least 55 years after the mine would close. Environmental review showed that water could be polluted for over 500 years. The North Met environmental impact statement asserted PolyMet would capture and treat over 90% of the contaminated, contaminated groundwater, but the draft permit does not require it. If PolyMet does not capture and treat polluted water, people downstream will suffer from water polluted with arsenic, mercury, copper, nickel, and other heavy metals. The draft, permit, the draft PolyMet permit to mine does not protect the public interest, puts people downstream at risk, and leaves taxpayers unprotected. As drafted by the PolyMet permit to mine doesn't protect Minnesotans and should be rejected by the Minnesota DNR. Laurel Melby, Laurel Melby, Anne, would you tap the pink mic? Is it working now? Anne, is the pink mic, or Heron, can you just check it so we know? Uh, Laurel Melby and also Beth Bartlett, Kathy Holzer, be making your way down. Okay, okay. thank you. I am Laurel Melby, spelled L-A-U-R-E-L-M-E-L-B-Y. I am from Duluth, Minnesota, but I raised my family in Finland, Minnesota, and I love a place called Lake Vermilion. I have harvested wild rice for 37 years with my husband, and I believe it is the canary in the mind, and we need to listen now, not when it's too late. I request that the DNR does its job by requiring this permit process to be done completely, followed completely, and I believe what they can see is that no sulfide mining has been done anywhere near reasonable cleanliness without extreme pollution. And I concede the rest of my time to Greg Benson. Hi, I'm Greg Benson. I'm a resident in Duluth and a business owner. I'm going to read really fast. I'm here representing 100 small businesses in the north. We're the Downstream Business Coalition. And we, we employ nearly 1,211 people. We're continuing to grow and reinvest in both our companies and our community. This equates to adding jobs and real dollars to the local economy. To continue this, our businesses depend on the health of the Lake Superior watershed. Uh, we are pro-iron ore mining and pro-jobs. We support and benefit from Ferris Mining, which originally built this economy of the North. We rely on mine products in our businesses. As primarily owner-operators, we are pro-worker and pro-quality of life, and we have and will continue to re rely on union labor as we expand our facilities. But because we are so dependent on the health of our water, we are concerned about copper-nickel mining. 
The proposed poly met, north met, copper nickel mine, and others like it are vastly different from ferrous mining, as we've been hearing all night. Um, I'm going to just jump ahead here. Uh, we trust that PolyMet intends to meet all applicable regulations, but our concerns are based on the track record of similar projects. We welcome them to show us one metallic sulfide mine of this type that has operated for 10 years and been closed for 10 years. Even the state-of-the-art, now-closed flambeau mine touted to by PolyMet supporters as a mine that operated without polluting local waters has now been shown to have caused significant groundwater and surface water pollution. There is an alternative to the boom and bust extraction economy that benefits foreign corporations and leaves local communities worse off in the end. Our locally owned small businesses are proof positive that a more sustainable model is possible. We will continue to reinvest the wealth we create in new jobs over the next 20 years and beyond. Uh, we call on our state Ten. and local politicians to do this. And uh, Senator Bach, the, how many of those spaceships actually blew up? Time. Beth? Test, test. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name, <clears throat> is it working? It's my gone. name is Beth Bartlett. B-E-T-H-B-A-R-T-L-E-T-T. -T -T. I live in Duluth. I'd like to address two specific issues. The first is that the 1854 treaty, treaty city territory goes right through the Duluth complex rock in question, yet there has been no consultation with the tribes who hold the rights to hunt, fish, and gather in this territory. The indigenous people of this region will be disproportionately affected by any toxic contamination of water, fish, and wild rice resulting in harm to their health, livelihoods, culture, and well-being. Apparently, PolyMed as a Canadian corporation feels no need to uphold U.S. law and is quite willing to violate these treaties. You as public citizens, as citizens of Minnesota, it is all of our duties to ensure that those treaty rights are upheld. It is also the ethical responsibility of all of us who are settlers to do everything in our power to do no further harm to the Anishinaabe land, people, and religious and spiritual practices, to take every opportunity to do what we can to support the restoration of these. Second, one of the bodies of water into which toxic contamination would flow is the St. Louis River, as we've heard all night. This puts all of us living in Duluth, in the Duluth region, especially those in Fond du Lac, at risk. We've heard a lot about heavy metals. I imagine you've heard about it over and over again. But do we really know what any of these do? So just to focus on one, mercury and methylmercury. We need to learn from the Minamata disaster in Japan in the late 1950s, where mercury levels in the flesh of fish in contaminated water were more than a million times higher than that of the water they swam in. In Minamata, the first signs were cats going crazy and dying. In humans, methylmercury poisoning first causes hands and feet to tingle, then it becomes increasingly difficult to hold objects, becomes difficult to speak, and hearing becomes muffled. General paralysis sets in, hands become gnarled, swelling becomes difficult, and death soon follows. In the wound, the placenta can magnify levels of toxic chemicals even more. Developing organs are extremely sensitive to damage. Methylmercury interferes with the critical period of brain cell migration, resulting in high rates of miscarriage, severe physical maldevelopment, and mental impairment to those babies who do survive. I don't think any of you would wish this on anyone, let alone all of the many generations of children yet to be born. And not only of humans, but of deer, moose, walleye, all beings that depend on clean, fresh water for life. In this water-rich environment, all beings are at risk for generations to come. And as report on the lessons from Minamata, the Japanese government stated that having learned vital lessons from the misery caused by Minamata disease and other painful manifestations of pollution as a consequence of this misconceived priority, and that's the, their term, it is Japan's sincere wish to see other countries becoming fully aware of the importance of environmental consideration based on Japan's experiences and lessons learned and establishing a sustainable society without experiencing the misery of pollution like Minamata disease, end quote. I urge you not to let this project Ten. become yet another misconceived priority and not issue permits for the PolyMed Mine Project. Thank you. Kathy Holzer, Sam Hodell and Mike Madden be making your way down. Go ahead, Kathy. My name is Kathy Heltzer, H-E-L-T-Z-E-R. I yield my time to Bill Hansen from Grand Marais, Minnesota. Commissioners, deputy commissioners, uh, Thank you for letting me testify today and your time. The, uh, I'd also like to especially thank the community 
uh, mediators for their time and service and the ASL interpreters who have been doing a great job up here. So thank you very much. My name is Bill Hansen, H-A-N-S-E-N. -E My parents founded Sawbill Canoe Outfitters at the end of the Sawbill Trail in Tofty in 1957. My wife Cindy and I bought the business from them 35 years ago. We made a dignified living over those years, raised four children, sold the business to our daughter and son-in-law two years ago. In addition to my small business career, I've involved myself as deeply as I can in regional economic development over the last three decades. I've been fortunate and honored to serve as a trustee and board chair of the Northland Foundation and the Entrepreneur Fund. These organizations have been longtime partners with private companies, lending institutions, government agencies in creating jobs in northeastern Minnesota. These partnerships have spanned every sector of the economy, including mining services, tourism, healthcare, manufacturing, service industries, and so on. I'm honored to have played a modest role in supporting diverse local economic development. My very first vote at my very first board meeting at the Northland Foundation was in favor of providing an emergency loan to a struggling small company called Cirrus Designs. Initially, I welcomed the prospect of precious mineral mining in our region. But as the PolyMet project has moved through the study and approval process, I've become convinced that it's simply bad economic development. Northeastern Minnesota has a long history of backing economic development projects that end badly. The chopsticks factory is the poster child, but unfortunately, there have been many other examples, large and small, of which you are aware. I believe that PolyMet is another economic development mistake, promising prosperity and wealth, but very unlikely to deliver on those promises. In my opinion, it boils down to what kind of community do we want to leave to our grandchildren and great-grandchildren? Do we put our trust in huge foreign-owned corporations with long histories of labor and environmental violations, leaving a trail of depressed communities and perpetual pollution? Or do we roll up our sleeves, invest in ourselves, and build a regional economic system that is diverse, resilient, sustainable, respectful to our people, our environment, our health, our communities, and our long-term future. We can do better. And as a good friend of mine said in this very room in 2002 at the AFL-CIO convention, we all do better when we all do better. Thank you. Sam Hodel. My name is Sam Hodel, and I'd like to cede my time to Josh Skelton. Hi, good evening. My name is Josh Skelton, S-K-E-L-T-O-N, and I reside in Coleraine, Minnesota, uh, but I grew up in Hoyt Lakes. My wife and I are both chemical engineers, licensed professionally here in the state of Minnesota, and we've made a very conscious decision to locate our family here where we don't believe there's any better quality of life. I'm here tonight to urge the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and the Department of Natural Resources to grant these permits in a timely manner because the proposed PolyMet NorthMet project will provide consequential <laughs> impacts to our region and our way of life. In a time where our region has been decimated from a lack of professional opportunity, this NorthMet project brings hope in the form of an estimated 1,000 jobs. These types of jobs and wages that come from building and operating and maintaining a project of this scale will have long-term benefits on a region where the very social and moral fabric that makes it so unique has become storied in history books instead of the reality in our own front yards. The ability to work and live in this area has been hanging in the balance as the science and technology proposed with this mining operation has been vetted deeply and with the review of your agencies deemed adequate to provide a framework to protect all that we cherish. Your work has been important to help us assure that those same things we hope draw and retain our families will be with us for a long time and not just a season, and we can coexist with this mining operation. But it's time to put these great minds to work, and as a result, bring in and retain employees of the future to become the great pillars of our communities to help lead our schools, businesses, churches, and community organizations. It's time to write a new chapter in our history that shows the region can persevere, it can reinvent, and building from a long tradition like iron mining, propagate state-of-the-art technologies once again, serving our nation and leading the world in safe, efficient, and responsible practices. Worldwide demand for copper is material and will continue to build with our appetite and strategic goals to reduce our own carbon footprint and modernize our way of life. 
If we are serious about transforming our energy landscape to meet these goals like integrating more renewables and advanced technologies for energy production and delivery, responsibly mining these materials will be critical to address any global threats. Copper is an essential material to build these energy systems of the future and being able to rely on a domestic source with high accountability for impacts on the environment will allow us to meet those needs with the highest integrity. Being from Hoyt Lakes and living in the region, I'm eager to see the former LTV facilities refurbished and modernized and returned to operation, bringing back hundreds of good Ten. paying jobs and helping to lead the charge on making our world a better and safer place. I urge you to get these permits issued in a timely manner. We have no more time to waste. Time. Mike Madden, Mike, also Ryan Sistad, Jerry Freiberger, come on up and be getting ready. Are you Mike? My name is uh, Jerry Freiberger. I'm a native of Duluth, educated, and is Mike Madden here? Hold on. Is Mike Madden here? No. Is Ryan Sistad here? Okay, Ryan and then Jerry. Oh, sorry. sorry. I was just trying to get people to come up so we're ready to pop. All right, go for it. Uh, I'm Ryan Sisted. I fully support the PolyMet project, but uh, I'll be deferring here to Craig Fellman. My name is Craig Fellman, C R E I G F E L L M A N. I'm from Duluth. Um, appreciate the opportunity to speak on the draft permits here today for the PolyMet NorthMet project. I was born in Duluth and I was uh, raised in Northeast Minnesota and I am a PolyMet supporter. And I want to talk about what I feel is at the heart of northern Minnesota um, with my issue. Personally, I love everything about the natural beauty of northern Minnesota and every season that it offers it. I also love our growing craft beer industry in northern Minnesota, and it's true that we need to diversify the economy of northern Minnesota. Um, but tourism and beer production is not going to carry the load. Uh, neither will only focusing on iron mining and paper production. The economic strength of our region does rely on responsible use of natural resources. And we do need future growth alongside of the traditional industries that we have relied upon. But the future diversification will involve and still will involve industries that engage in responsible use of our natural resources, our land, our water, our minerals and forest products. This is exactly what PolyMet is offering us, a major step in strengthening the economy of northern Minnesota through, through responsible use of the natural resources. This is not going to be another natural resource-based project that we're going to talk about for a couple years, and then someone's going to take it away and go build it in a state like North Dakota or Indiana, like we've seen many times over the last several years, because the standard elsewhere is a lot weaker. We have the resources here. We're going to build this project here. And I appreciate PolyMet's commitment to making this project work right here in Minnesota. The process in Minnesota is detailed, it's stringent, it's difficult because it needs to be. And PolyMet has worked this environmental process for over 12 years and spent over $100 million in their commitment to be responsible. You can go ahead and study it yourself. It's all out there. Don't rely on somebody else to tell you the deal. Go get the info. Read about this project controls for water quality. The long-term water treatment plan this project is proposing. Read about this project's tailing basin foundation and stability and the reuse of the LTV site. They are doing the right thing. PolyMet offers northern Minnesota a great deal through responsible use of natural resources. And I appreciate that PolyMet is going to provide over $70 million in federal, state, and local taxes, 15 million, which is gonna go locally and fund every different school district. And I appreciate the $500 million economic impact we'll feel throughout northern Minnesota, which is very vital Ten. for us. And so are the jobs that it's gonna create. 600 indirect jobs and 360 direct jobs. North Met project is needed in northern Minnesota. Ten. And PolyMet is Okay, Jerry, now you. After Jerry, Todd Leiden and Keith Hayoyala. Hayoyala. Coming up to the front so you're ready to go. Jerry, you're next. Yep, now we're ready for you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, uh, the representatives from the MPCA and the Department of Natural Resources of the State of Minnesota. 
Uh, my name is Jerry Freiberger, F as in Frank, R-Y-B-E-R-G-E-R. -E -E I'm chairman of the board of Halla Dog Company, a local company, and uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Duluth. And I am one of these people who thinks that uh, our co-lead agencies, and along with Polymet and all kinds of other uh, consultants, have done a superlative job. I am very proud to be a Minnesotan. I am very proud of the PolyMet project and the thoroughness and the level of excellence that happened. Uh, over the past 11 years of responsibly addressing the environmental and processing challenges, we have watched this project gradually uh, develop. Uh, from its infancy, when we did the initial drilling to define the extent of the oil reserve, uh, to the design of mine, power, rail, and other structure, uh, project infrastructure, decades of unprecedented, in-depth, respectable research uh, of the mining process to ensure protection of our air and water from possible toxic wastes, the enlightened, visionary, and responsible collaboration of regulatory agencies, namely the EPA, the Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Forest Service, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, and the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency have done a superlative job of working together and working through the difficult challenges of this new operation. Continuing the rich heritage of Minnesota's mining industry, a major contributor of America's industrial growth and national security, Minnesotans should be proud of this project. After more than a decade of persevering effort and expenditures in excess of $300 million to develop environmentally responsible mining and processing practices, PolyMet will arguably be the benchmark of copper nickel mining, not only in Minnesota, but in North America as well. They will provide the minerals so necessary to produce the technological advances in support of our nation's ever increasing standard of living while providing the jobs and taxes to support our local iron range communities. Uh, what's happened here under the uh, wonderful leadership of these co lead agencies in PolyMet, progress that PolyMet has made in the past 11 years in the development of Minnesota's first non-ferrous copper nickel mine is certainly a milestone, an important milestone in which our mining industry will now no longer be judged upon mining, how mining was done more than a century ago, 1870s, or even decades ago, but rather by the state of the art of present mining technology and enlightened environmental Ten. standards based upon the science of this 21st century. I thank you very much. Todd Leiden. My name is Todd Leiden. I'm a strong supporter of PolyMet NorthMet project, and I defer my time to Pat Mullen. Good evening. My name is Pat Mullen. I'm Senior Vice President of External Affairs for Elite, which is the parent company of Minnesota Power. What a special, high quality environment and beautiful outdoors we have here in northeastern Minnesota. The Boundary Waters and the Superior National Forest are gems that attract millions of visitors to our region and form a playground for people lucky enough to live and visit here. Some people frame the decision on PolyMet's permits as pitting the economy against the environment, and for a number of reasons, I believe those can coexist. PolyMet's mining proposal is an opportunity that shouldn't be squandered. The economic benefits of this project are significant and will help support hundreds of families in northeastern Minnesota for decades to come. Hundreds of new good paying jobs, millions of dollars in spending right here in northern Minnesota, as well as new tax revenue for state and local governments. Minnesota has some of the toughest environmental standards in the nation. PolyMet's permit conditions, determined after more than a dozen years of environmental review, set the requirements for monitoring, operating, reporting, and inspections for the mine during construction, operation, and closure. These permit conditions and requirements are fair and reasonable and include protections for our environment and our health. Through the environmental review and permitting process, PolyMet has demonstrated that it can meet those tough Minnesota standards. Closing a mine safely will cost a lot of money, and the permit to mine protects Minnesota taxpayers financially too. It doubles the bankruptcy-proof financial assurance amounts from one year to two, showing how the state and PolyMet have gone to extra lengths to ensure taxpayers are protected in case of a bankruptcy, and that the mine and processing facilities are properly closed and reclaimed. Taken together, the permit conditions and financial assurances provide a path for mining and environmental protection to coexist while making sure the mine will be safe 
and responsibly closed when that time comes. From a utility perspective, the metals polymet will produce are essential to our quality of life and especially to the production of clean energy. Copper is a critical component of the transformation of the nation's energy landscape. It's used in large quantities with wind turbines and solar arrays and used in the wires needed to get that carbon-free energy to customers. Electric cars require copper too, along with nickel, a key ingredient in the batteries that fuel them. As our nation moves ever forward in clean energy, we're going to need more and more of these metals. Mining these metals in the United States and right here in northeastern Minnesota under our tough standards, rather than a faraway country that might not offer the same environmental protections, makes good sense for our nation. Let's open a new chapter for mining on the Iron Range with Polymet and not squander the opportunities so we can prove that copper nickel mining and clean environment can coexist while also boosting the fortunes of a part of Minnesota that could use some good financial news right now. Thank you for your time and the opportunity Ten. to address this important issue. Keith. Keith Hayoyala. Aurora Bear. Seeing neither, move on to Lisa Raniate. Anna Lanimi. Gerald Tyler. You're Anna? Come on up, Anna. Yeah. Name is perhaps the name is perhaps Lisa Ronquist, and we couldn't read your name. Is that Ronnie Eight? Is there a Ronquist here? All right. I'm ready. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Anna Elinami, and I have been participating in this process for close to a decade. And when I first got involved, we were lowering the sulfate standards, and then we were studying the impact on wild rice, millions of dollars on the impacts. Then we are changing land exchange uh, legislation, and it's one thing after another, and we're, we've supposedly got these strong mining laws that we don't necessarily follow, and they get, they get changed behind closed doors, and the process hasn't been transparent, and there's a lot of misconception. These precious metals, this copper, it's not coming to us. It's going to the open market, and it's only 10% of the open market, so it's unlikely to ever come back to us and impact us. There's a lot of really slippery language. I personally have been studying extreme weather events around the world, and they are on the increase. Just this weekend, in Australia, 152 milliliters of water, sorry, 152 centimeters of water in a 24-hour period has parts of the region completely shut down. Flooding in South America, extreme weather in Russia, the jet stream is changing. We don't understand all these things. Yet, when I went downstairs and spoke to the water people, they said that they do a look at a 30 years of highs and lows, but we know right now that in the next 15 years, everywhere in the world is expected to be getting an increase in these 100-year events. So that means we don't know what to expect out of these changes. Climate change is real. We know it's here. It's one extreme to another. It's a thaw and it's a freeze, and it's a thaw and a freeze. In New Brunswick, Canada, just this weekend, a small creek froze up and then they had a warm, warm spat and it caused everything to thaw and more rain to fall. Well, the creek was ice jammed, so it flooded a parking lot. And then the temperature dropped to 20 below zero, plus a wind chill. The cars were frozen in place. What if that happens with this polymet mine? What kind of accommodations are being made 
for these extreme conditions that our urban engineers okay. don't even understand. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I hope that we continue to have this public comment process long into the future. So I want to just go back and make sure Lisa Ronquist, we did not read your last name handwriting. So if you are here, identify yourself to volunteer. We're moving on to Gerald Tyler. If you see your name up here now, just because some people have gone home, come up now. I don't see Gerald. Gerald? No, keep on coming though. <laughs> Catherine Przinski? Okay, thank you. I'm Catherine Przinski, Minneapolis, and I'm ceding my time to Alan Richardson. My name's Alan Richardson, A-L-L-E-N-R-I-C-H-A-R-D-S-O-N, -L -L -E uh, from Duluth. You know, I, I want to say that it's one of my least favorite things to be in a state of political opposition with members of the labor movement. I really and truly uh, dislike it. I feel like it's a, it's a, it's a false dichotomy and that we're, we're being maneuvered against each other. And uh, I sincerely hope that we can come together to build an economy that does not require an open-ended amount of water uh, treatment. Uh, hopefully working together, we can build a more uh, resilient uh, future than that. And um, so I'm here to, uh, my opinion as a citizen is to give a vote of no confidence in the Polymet uh, project. I will say that I'm, I'm glad that what we share with our labor brothers and sisters is that we, are, we come from a culture of science and um, uh, I want to invoke the, uh, the CO2 question on this project. So over 20 years of mining, PolyMed would release 15.8 uh, million tons of CO2 equivalent pollution, which is more than 10 million tons from burning fossil fuels. And on an annual basis, PolyMed CO2 equivalent uh, pollution would be 700,342 tons per year, which is more than a quarter of the carbon footprint of all of Duluth including commercial, industrial, uh, residential transport, and uh, waste sectors. Um, I, uh, I remember well in August of 2014 when the Mount Polly uh, copper nickel tailings dam uh, in Canada blew out, releasing 6.3 billion gallons of polluted water. You know, and I'm, I'm certain that they had a long environmental impact statement that uh, the Mount Polly mine was heralded as a state-of-the-art uh, facility uh, at the time. And, uh, you know, and I'm sure those folks, you know, uh, loved their families and there were probably a lot of outdoorsmen who worked on that project, but uh, that's one hell of a mess. Um, I also want to say that um, you know, based on environmental review documents, the hydrometallurgical waste facility that is attached to this project uh, would have sulfate concentrations above uh, 7,300 milligrams per liter, uh, which is 700 times Minnesota's wild rice sulfate standard, and over 20 years of operations that would hold uh, uh, 3,280 pounds of highly toxic uh, mercury. So again, speaking directly to my brothers and sisters in labor, I, I would hope that you would expand your concept of solidarity to include wild, the wild rice Ten. protection that is enshrined in treaty law, which is the true law of this land. Thank you for your time. Larry, Larry Bogolov is here. Please step up to the yellow mic. Just a forty. Oh. Are you Larry? Yeah, I'm Larry. Oh, wrong mic, but go for it there. Okay. That's Thank fine. Thank you. You just have to turn on that. Good one. evening. My name is Larry Bogola from St. Paul, Minnesota. I am a uh, full union teacher in Minneapolis teaching at the Northrop Environmental School. I do not want to see the PolyMet proposal go forward, and I'm going to cede my time over now to Nancy Schunt. Thank you. Thank you. Can I speak from the yellow mic? Yeah. As long as it's on. <laughs> Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm Nancy Schult, N-A-N-C-Y-S-C-H-U-L-D-T. I live in Duluth, but for the last 20 years I've worked for the Fond du Lac Band as their water quality specialist. And it's been a long 12 years 
um, of trying to understand what this project is going to do and how it can potentially be done in accordance with state and federal rules. Um, along with my other tribal counterparts, we've spent a lot of time preparing and submitting very detailed, very extensive, very substantive comments for the last 12 years. And yet, it's been really frustrating to see so little of that expertise that has come from the tribes reflected in the environmental review, the results of that environmental review. And now as I'm reading through these massive documents, I wouldn't call it efficiency personally to have to review four major permits at one time, but there's very little of that reflected in what I'm seeing coming out in permits right now. So many of those major differences of opinions were kicked down the road until permitting. And I don't see them resolved or addressed in the permits so far. There's a big question that the tribes raised back in August, and we can't get a simple answer to a question about how many acres of wetlands will actually directly be impacted by this project. It seems like it's awfully late in the game to have questions hanging over something that is so fundamental to all four of the permits that we're talking about tonight. And as a downstream water quality regulator, the band can say that we fundamentally disagree with the 401 certification. We know that the existing mines and the way they are regulated in this state with all of its stringent environmental regulations are polluting waters already. And that there's nothing in the proposal for this project, in the permits for this project that give me any kind of confidence or provide any evidence that this project will control its water pollution either. So I'll be submitting another round of substantial and extensive comments on all four of these permits. Ten. Thank you. Joseph, Joseph Rorty. Joseph. Nancy Deaver. Doug Krista. You, Nancy? Yes. All right. Uh, Nancy, N-A-N-C-Y, Deaver, D-E-E-V-E-R, -E -E Duluth. Agua esta vida. Water is life. Um, in the 90s, I chose to leave this land of water, don't ask me why, and move to the arid southwest. I lived for several years in Silver City, New Mexico, next to one of the largest open pit copper mines in the country. It didn't disgust me, it didn't bother me, because it was what it was. It had been there a long time, as many copper mines are. The western United States is very arid. It's a different um, geology, different everything compared to um, our, land, our land of waters and watersheds and um, water everything. So I, was, I had to learn something very important out there. Whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. That is one of their, their mantras. Also, water goes, flows upward, uphill to money in New Mexico because of water rights. We don't have that problem here. Um, but water is really at the, at, I think, the bottom of the contention here. Um, I have, uh, I'm an environmental um, researcher and mostly in native plants and botany, but I have a real strong background in teaching water quality and hydrology. It's my love because I've always, I'm an Aquarian, what can I say? And I um, have been on the fence since I moved back here about seven years ago and heard about this project. Um, mines, mining companies everywhere do not have a good reputation. It, and people who make their living from them know that. They understand that. It's not a happy situation in Cobre, New Mexico, where I knew people. They, you know, the mine gave them work. I actually worked in the mine doing some um, botanical research for the company. My, my husband was a Forest Service employee. So I know my way around some of those places. And uh, coming back here and listening to the testimony, this is brand new for me. I've never spoken to a public audience like this. But I, I'm going to remind you of something, that the focus of all this. The results of all this are because, in the, in the, the, um, the, I guess the uh, arguing on both sides 
is really because of our most precious resource. We cannot replace it. We cannot remake it. Um, when certain things happen to water, it, it, we can't fix it. Um, Lagua, water is life. So I would just like to point out that no matter which side of the debate you're on, water always wins. Nature is smarter, stronger, and more resilient than we give her credit for. And so I just want to remind, when I taught science, I told my kids, and how many of you played rock, scissors, paper? 10. OK, what beats all, all three of those elements when you play that game? Water melts the paper, erodes the rock, and rusts the scissors. Folks, Ten. no matter which. <laughs> Doug, Doug, go ahead. I'm Doug Christie. You spelt the name wrong, but that's all right. It's, I apologize. It's T Y, and I'm from Grand Rapids. I'm a, I'm a proud union member and a representative for Sheet Metal Workers Local 10 for Northern Minnesota. Ten. I'm going to give my time up to Dave Lestergaard. Hi, my name is uh, Dave Lislegard, uh, L-I-S-L-E-G-A-R-D, and uh, I am the mayor of Aurora, Minnesota. And I think it's very well known that uh, the struggles that our community has had, but um, I want people to know that we truly do care to do the right thing the right way. My grandfather, uh, my grandfather built the Erie Mining Company. My dad worked there, I worked there. And we're hoping that many of our family members can continue to work there. My message is, is to all of you. I respect um, you guys for your, your, your caring. Um, we may not agree, but I think that as long as we can have this open dialogue and uh, communicate in a professional and a polite manner, that we can come to some sort of resolve. And I, think, and I don't believe that it's all or nothing. Um, and I want to leave saying thank you for all of your hard work as the agencies. I want to thank the company for doing their due diligence and, uh, and, and, and for the state of Minnesota. This isn't just for our region. And I want Duluth and uh, Lake Superior to know that our goal, the agency's goal and the company's goal, is not to pollute the water that goes to Lake Superior. That is not our goal, in all due respect. Our goal is, is to do the right thing the right way and provide jobs. So I thank you for your due diligence. Our communities thank you for your due diligence. I appreciate it. Thank you. Scott, Scott Frank. Scott Frank. Scott Bowl. Come on up. And if Charlotte Evans and Thomas Hansen are here, please come up. We're getting towards the end, so we want to time it right. So come on up so we know you're here. Scott, go ahead. OK. Hi, I'm Scott Bull. Um, I, uh, I believe the research, and it shows that a sulfide mining has not been done safely ever. And to watch it for 500 years, I don't know, no one here is going to be that person that's going to do that. Um, uh, brothers and sisters, I want us to figure out how we can help the common good. Now, I, I think, I, I hope a lot of you w want that also. Uh, let's have jobs for everyone. There's better ways. Following the dark money, following the one percent's analysis uh, is, is, is is short-sighted. We have to uh, create jobs in another way. It turns out, you know, the science is helping us in many ways. It's pointed out that uh, climate change is real. We need to create other alternative energy. There can be so many millions of jobs with this. Um, you know, they, they retooled after World War II, during World War II, after the bombing of, of uh, um, Pearl Harbor, so let's uh, retool and move away from uh, uh, all these uh, fossil fuels. We, we, we can do it. We can create the jobs. There's other ways, but following the corporate analysis, the dark money, the 1% ideas of where we should get our jobs, this kind of mining is not safe. It's not been done. So we have to look at other ways. There's so many other options. We have to look for the common good. Right now we allow three people in this country to have more wealth than half of our nation. That's in Forbes magazine. I'm not making this stuff up. That hurts my mind to conceptualize that. Three people have more wealth than half of our nation. 
We need to distribute our wealth better than that. I think that along with having a minimum wage, we have to have a maximum wage. I don't see how we can allow three people to have as much money as half of our nation. So we have to do better at looking out for the common good. We need to retool creating alternative energy jobs. We have to say no to sulfide mining. It's just too great a risk. We can't risk our water. I know those that are desperate for a paycheck have a hard time grasping this because they're blinded by the possibility of a job. We've made people too desperate. I know that uh, I work with some folks in, on the food shelf and uh, there's a lot of folks that are desperate for a meal and uh, I'm sorry that folks on the Iron Range are, are looking so hard for jobs and they're losing their kids moving away because they're not jobs. There's other ways. We can do a new deal. We can do it like we did. A green new deal would be a beautiful thing, creating the jobs, a lot of possibilities. There's so many other options. We have to think beyond what the corporation's analysis is giving us. Where am I? I think that's about it. Let's take care of each other. Charlotte, Charlotte Evans. Thomas Hansen. Stephanie Pearson. Becky Hall. Any of those four here? Raise your hand quick. All right, we're going to go to just pulling names. You're going to have to help me if we pull somebody who's already spoken. <laughs> um, Dale Olson of Duluth. Are you here? Or Randy Parker of Duluth. Sheila. Shally of Stillwater. Scott Mellon of Duluth. Jessica Bleichner of Brainerd. Thank you, come on up. While you're walking, I'm gonna pull another name just to see. JT Haynes. Here, already spoke. Thank you for your help. All right, Jessica. Hello, my name is Jessica Bleichner, J-E-S-S-I-C-A-B-L-E-I-C-H-N-E-R. -S -S -E -E I'm from Brainerd, Minnesota. And this is hard for me to do, so excuse my uh, warbly voice. <laughs> um, I am a Minnesota Master Naturalist volunteer specializing in youth education about watersheds and water quality. I do water quality monitoring volunteering. So this is a topic that's very near and dear to me. Um, my issue with this mine in this location is because of the watershed. Every watershed has a poor point and an entry point. They're trying to put this mine in at the very top of the watershed so it can pollute anything downstream. What's downstream? Some of our only clean water that is not at all contaminated in the entire state. I encourage you to look at the RAPS reports from local watersheds. A RAPS report is from the Pollution Control Agency. It's a watershed restoration and protection strategy. Please take these into consideration as you're making your decision because there is not a single RAPS report in the state that encourages further pollution and contamination of our waterways. Um, we have very little fresh water in the entire world. Minnesota is already looking to export some of our water resources. This is an incredibly valuable resource, far more valuable than anything that's below our ground, any mineral, anything. Like everybody says, water is life. We need it to live. Um, I have my children here with me tonight that I educate, along with many others in the community. And what we teach them is that it's very important to take very, very, very high considerations as to what kind of developments that we are going to be making to affect these future resources. The risk is just far too great with this mining proposal. Um, Water is a closed dynamic system, so nothing ever leaves it. What we put into it, we generally cannot take out. 
So risking what very, very, very little clean water we have left on this planet as a resource just does not make sense for our future generations. With that also in mind, uh, this is a boom and bust system. This is not going to be a long-term uh, benefit to our state, in my opinion. So when it busts, who's left with the cost? It's not going to be us. It's going to be our kids. I care so very much about our future generations. And what are they going to have to drink? What are they going to have for life if we contaminate everything? We can't do this, please. Um, also, this is public land. How is leasing this to a private company going to benefit me wanting to access these public lands? How can I go benefit from that forest? How can I benefit from these lakes that are public lands that are supposed to be accessible by everybody if it is under the control of a private corporation? Ten. I just want to say thank you to all the water protectors that have been working just as diligently for the decade that this has been going on. I've been here with you for five years of it. Let's keep on going. Please Time. take this into consideration. Thank you. Is Kim Davis from Shakopee here? Kim Davis from Shakopee? Are you Kim? Hi, I'm Kim Davis, K-I-M-D-A-V-I-S. I'm from Shakopee, Minnesota, and I support the water. I'm going to turn this over to Paul Christensen. Hi, good evening. I'm Paul Christensen, uh, Kim's husband. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I will keep it very short since we're at the end of the session. Um, I'm a U.S. Navy veteran for clean water. Uh, my wife and I... My wife and I own property in Lake County, and we will be building a house and moving to this region in about five years. And this type of mining does not belong in Minnesota. Uh, the toxic pollution from the mines will last hundreds of years, as we've, as we've heard. Uh, there's no guarantee that it'll be cleaned up, even though they say it will. Uh, Polymet and Glencore are only in this for short-term profit. Please do not issue the permits. Thank you. Julius Salinas from ESCO. Julius, is that, are you raising your hand because you're Julius right there? OK. Um, let's see. We have Brian Rochnick. Brian here? We have time for one more. Brian Hansen from Duluth. Okay, we'll go with Julius since you're up here and we'll pull in more names if there's time. My name's Julius Salinas, J-U-L-I-U-S, S-A-L-I-N-A-S. And uh, my father was a World War II combat vet. My uncles were combat vets. There's Purple Hearts involved there. In 1971 and 72 of those summers, I worked at U.S. Steel. I made eight bucks an hour, and I sure appreciate that. I support miners, but I do not support this mine. Insurance companies are in business to make money, and they've proved to be very successful. They do well because they do their homework. Reviewing the science and mechanical prob mathematical probability associated with risks before they're willing to accept them. According to Polymet's own research, the proposed copper nickel mine would be in production for 20 years, but the wastewater and tailings from the operation would need to be treated for as much as 500 years and contained for as long as the water or the waste materials remain toxic. As of this date, every sulfide mine in a water-rich environment has contaminated surface and or groundwater as a result. This proposed mine would also violate treaty rights granted to indigenous peoples by the U.S. government. Due to its incredibly high probability of contaminating the land and resources in ceded territories, uh, this is not a sound decision. The largest sources of Superfund liability to U.S. taxpayers are mines exactly like the one PolyMed is proposing. With the EPA concluding 
that the probability of potential failure of water collection and treatment of the proposed polymet mine is 93%. Is there really any question of its practicality? From a business perspective, this is an intolerable risk. There's not an insurance company on the planet that would accept this risk. If an insurance policy covering the cost of hazardous cleanup was negotiated, the premiums would be so high that no private company would be willing, to, willing or able to pay it. The risk is clear, but it is being clouded by the promise of money. How much is a clean environment worth to our descendants? How much money will it cost to have clean water and healthy habitat for plants and animals? The toxic liquid waste will need to be treated for 500 years. What are the odds of just one leak in 500 years? The proposed mine project is a con. The business plan is to go through the motions of appearing to care for the health of people, communities, and the environment in order to receive required approvals that will unnecessarily expose every living thing in the Lake Superior watershed Ten. to irreparable damage when the toxic waste uh, is 99 percent is waste. This is uh, it's it's not a sound decision, and uh, I Ten. hope we don't have this mind. It's Alex Spitzer from Minneapolis here. Alex, we've got three minutes. Hello. Nice. Uh, hello, my name is Alex Spitzer, and I am a senior at the University of Minnesota. I am studying environmental law. I am originally from Chicago, but one of the main reasons I want to come to the University of Minnesota was because Minnesota has been known for its progressiveness when it comes to environmental issues. And I refuse to stand by and let Minnesota be bullied into disregarding its environmental principles by corporations <laughs> like Polymet and Glencore. These corporations don't care about what happens to Minnesota citizens, which is why it is your responsibility to intervene and protect them. Anyone who truly looks at and understands the science behind this project would undoubtedly see that the, it would be devastating for our state. Copper nickel mining is not like other mining. It is much more environmentally risky and dangerous than other kinds of mining. There has never been a copper nickel mine built on a water rich environment that has not resulted in toxic water pollution. The US Environmental Protection Agency has concluded that during the time the sulfide mine is operating, the rate of failure of pollution collection systems is 93%. And after the mine closes, there's been a 100% rate of failure of pollution collection. Seepage from Polymet's copper nickel sulfide mine pits, tailings, and other wastes containing sulfate and toxic heavy metals would last for over 500 years. That is long, that is, uh, Polymet would have to be treating the seepage for over twice the age of this country. Claiming that Polymet would be responsible, would responsibly take care of the pollution for that long is foolish. Additionally, Polymet has admitted that millions of gallons of contaminated wastewater from the mine site and tailing site would be released untreated into groundwater. The seepage would pollute drinking water, wetlands, rivers, and would increase downstream mercury contamination of fish. We need to stand our ground and protect Minnesota natural resources, taxpayers, and downstream properties. I love Minnesota, and I would like to live here the rest of my life. I am not asking you, I am begging you. Not just for me, but for my future family as well. Please do not allow these foreign corporations to come here, destroy our environment, and poison our communities. So I called um, Brian Hansen. Okay, so I called his name and I did not see him here. So Brian, you'll be the last speaker tonight. Well, it's not very often I get the last word, so that's great. Uh, my name is Brian Hansen, B R I A N H A N S O N. I'm a resident of Duluth and I grew up in Grand Rapids. I'm also the CEO of Apex, private sector led 
business development engine for Northeast Minnesota and Northwest Wisconsin. Apex investor members represent over 80 of the most influential companies in the region with the collaborative approach to promoting sustainable economic growth. Today, I'm here to urge the DNR and MPCA to respect the long, fair, and informative process that's been completed by issuing the permit to mine, along with related permits for the PolyMet NorthMet project. And please do so in a timely manner. Back in 2013, Apex invited PolyMet CEO John Cherry to speak with our group about the NorthMet project. Mr. Cherry informed our group about the quality of the copper, nickel, and precious minerals deposit. He talked about the massive recycling effort required to reuse the existing mining facilities of former LTV plant. He informed us that construction alone would require two million hours of work with thousands of tradespeople on site. He also spoke with pride about the 360 family sustaining jobs and 600 additional indirect jobs estimated to be created by the project. All of that was great, but you know what was particularly interesting to the people in that room? People like me learning about the project? The permitting process and the protection of our environment. Mr. Cherry shared the details of four state and federal agencies working together on an array of permits designed to protect our environment. He talked about how PolyMet staff and consultants, many of whom live and work right here in Duluth, were working together to create a plan that would address potential issues and provide a basis for solid permits. Based on the information provided and with the input of Apex members, including chemists, engineers, and scientists, Apex members concluded that a resolution of support for the PolyMet NorthMet project was in order and that resolution was passed in January of 2014. Since then, APEX has closely and carefully monitored the project, including the draft environmental EIS, the final EIS, and now these draft permits. In my assessment, the correct steps have been taken to move forward with the North Met mine permits. The DNR and PCA are issuing draft permits because PolyMet's mine can comply with strict state and federal environmental standards while protecting our land and water. Their ten. detailed work concludes more than 10 years of diligent study and review. Let's get on with it, folks. Thank you. By my unofficial count, uh, we, we heard from f 55 speakers. I want to thank those of you. I'd like to thank you for your quiet listening throughout the evening, as well as the administ administrators who listened and the volunteers. Good night. <laughs>